Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Salem Research Week. And this is our, our final day of what's been a fantastic uh, uh, program. And uh, we're, we have the Continuous Improvement and Implementation Science Day. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have um, yeah, two guests with us. Uh, the title of this presentation is Trust the Process. We acknowledge the Ghana people are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and pay respects to elders past, present and future. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people today. So my name's Simon Windsor, I'm the Manager of Research, Governance and Ethics here at Salen. Uh, we've got an um, uh, event platform that's called Hoover, uh, so you can scan that um, QR code there to download. We've got uh, the ability to ask questions for our, our speakers uh, all throughout the day. Uh, and we've also posed a question uh, to, to everyone that's attended the conference, um, uh, and it's titled, Where Should We Be in, in 12 Months' Time? So you can have a think about it today and, and put up your answers to, to that question. And uh, you know th these things were sort of a bit ambition and where we want to be in 12 months. We've got the active research trail, we've got a demo up in the foyer there, and we've got it also in the um, uh, corridor back to the main building itself there on level five. You can have a, a look at that. And that's where we're getting the internet to interact with physical objects. And then where can we use that? What applications um, can we apply in a clinical setting for our, for our consumers? We've just had a great uh, poster session with uh, two sets of posters, some excellent um, improvement initiatives highlighted there, and they'll also be in the break as well today. So we can move on to the session. So the facilitator for today's session um, is uh, Professor Rob Padbury. He's the executive lead of continuous improvement here at Salon, and also the clinical director of surgery and perioperative medicine. So uh, can I have a round of applause for Rob? Thank you, Simon. Now, I, the first thing I'd like to do is answer your question of where would I like to be in 12 months' time. <laughs> that might be in a faraway place. All right, so um, thank you for, for attending. I might notice it's not a very diverse audience. I'm not sure where all the men have gone, but it's a, a very female dominant audience, which is not unusual in these sorts of occasions. Um, trust the process is sort of how this is uh, in, uh, titled, but that may not be. Okay, so how do I advance? Right, okay, I think I've worked out how this works. Um, clinical improvement is not a new uh, concept in this organisation. And one of the things we tend to do, though, is to not take time to try and understand what's causing a problem. And that's where trust the process comes from, is we have a process of problem solving, of trying to identify what's causing a problem, introducing a solution, studying what happens, and then doing another so-called PDSA cycle. And trying to subvert the process by taking shortcuts only leads to disaster. So the trust the process is have faith that following the bits and undertaking it with what we could almost call scientific rigour has re produces results. Okay. But it also can advance the slides, no? Yeah, I'm pressing it and nothing's... All right. So it's a, it's a random thing, it's sort of, I could be like a trained monkey and I know how many pushes I have to do to make this happen. Okay, so there are a few ways of improving the quality of healthcare and recently we've seen a video by Brent James who through the ACHS presented a one and a half hour workshop a few months ago that a lot of people would have seen. But just to summarise two things, reducing unnecessary clinical variation and reducing quality associated waste. Now that sounds remarkably simple, but how do we actually get there? 
We spend a lot of time as healthcare professionals developing pr the professional knowledge. That is the bit where down here, subject, discipline, values. All our conferences, our webinars or whatever it might be, focus very much on developing content knowledge. We spend remarkably little time on this side, improvement knowledge, process systems, variation, psychology and theory of knowledge to actually be able to put this bit into practice. So what we're trying to address with Trust the Process, if you like, is developing and harnessing the improvement knowledge leading on to or using what Peter will be talking about after I sit down is implementation science. So continual improvement in care delivery is what we're aiming at. There's the safety bit but then there's the delivering quality, which is the quality beyond safety. This is very much a random event. Maybe if I do that. Three common problems that we encounter before we get onto this science. Assuming we know what the problem is without seeing what is actually happening. Now, I had experience of that when I first became the divisional director because it was immediately assumed by the hospital executive that I would know what, what was happening in surgery. I knew what was happening in a bit of surgery. But I would understand what the problems are and I would know intuitively what was causing them and of course I knew none of those things. And it took me a while to figure out that actually there was quite a lot, there was really not a great understanding that just because you're a clinician and working in the field, it didn't mean that you understood everything that was going on or indeed what the problems were or most certainly what was causing them. Then, assuming you knew how to fix a problem with finding out what is causing it, we tend in healthcare to be very solution focused. And we are delighted to dream something up and implement the solution without actually understanding what the problem is or what's causing it. And then when, once we have done that, we're very poor at closing the loop. To study the action that we've taken and the effect of it, both in terms of the desired outcome and in terms of the safety aspect or the unintended consequences which can occur. So there's a lot of missing bits and a lot of rigour that needs to be put around this. So we live in a data rich world and we're entering a world that promises an enormous amount with a lot of data, the so-called digital world, all this sort of thing, and how it will revolutionise healthcare. So we get all this data and healthcare system improves, just like that. Of course, there's a box in the middle. Magic will happen. Somehow, all this data, the digital world, the virtual world, and lots and lots of data, will transform us to the health system improves. But what sits in the box? Magic will happen. And this is the bit that I've seen a lot of presentations now in the last couple of years about data, the digital world and all this sort of thing, but I've not seen anybody talk about what's in the magic box. What transforms that data actually into health system improvement? So what I'm proposing to you is that the practice improvement program sits in the magic will happen box and that a lot of the tools that you require to convert the data through the magic will happen into health system improvement is found within improvement pr principles. Framing questions, the appropriate questions to find out what is happening is a very simple first step. Interpreting that data and converting it into useful, and I'll show you the data hierarchy in a minute, into useful information, the conversion to higher order, and then using the trust the process to learning to see, devising solutions, implementing solutions that we'll hear Peter be talking about, measuring outcomes, further improvements, sustaining. And then of course there's the bit of clinical standardisation which to some extent stands on its own. But there are a lot of things inside that magic will happen box that need to be learned, understood and used. I mentioned the data hierarchy, the data wisdom hierarchy. 
lots and lots of data, but it needs to be converted into those next steps. We have an expression, data masquerading as information, or knowledge, or wisdom, whatever. It needs to be critically analysed and interpreted in the light of information, knowledge, intelligence and wisdom. Computers can get, do up to the intelligence. Computers don't do wisdom. And that's where you need the expert workforce. The expert workforce with the fundamental knowledge to convert all this into wisdom that is then converted into action within the health sector. Yes, we can, we're probably up to knowledge even, but, and we're developing computer systems for artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that sort of thing, but we still have to apply the wisdom. And that's where the humans come in. Teichi Ono, who was one time head of Toyota, the lean thinking organization, made this statement some years ago. Go see and listen. In other words, the management need to be out there amongst the people Data is, of course, important, but I place greater emphasis on facts. What he was recognising was the hierarchy of turning data into, along the chain into wisdom. So what is the Clinical Improvement Program itself? We run a formal training program. It's a training program for healthcare improvement boast, boast, uh, based on quality improvement principles for clinical leaders. It's derived from industry but it includes the completion of a healthcare improvement project and you'll hear about some of these. Some of you in the room have already done them, but you'll hear about these a bit later. It commenced in, um, in Australia in 19, uh, 1999 in New South Wales, it was linked to similar programs across the world. The SA courses first commenced in 2004. There was a hiatus, they ceased in 2012 and we reinstituted in Salem in 2018 aimed at people who can make a difference in their organisation, that's actually everybody. Uses validated tools introduced by a number of people, as I said, essentially an industry over many years, customised to the health environment. Uses concepts from many different brands of improvement and the Clinical Improvement Program is not a brand, it's a method to utilise various tools to understand what's going on and solve your, hopefully solve your problems and oversee the implementation of solutions. Participants in the course learn the theory. They hopefully learn the tools, the team skills and apply the knowledge to a project. So it's education on the run, if you like. It's education by doing. And then we aim to train a faculty. The faculty goals are to lead, facilitate improvement projects, become, turn the organisation into an improvement organisation through uh, on the ground methods. So what can it achieve? It's the trust the process thing, develop a systematic approach to identify problems, diagnose causative factors, problem solve, implement and study changes. The learn to see identifying whether there is really a problem that needs to be solved, and then taking time, and time is important, to do the diagnostics. Don't assume you know the answer. Intervene and measure, feedback, and then repeat. It cannot achieve miracles in the absence of clinician engagement in an unsupported environment. One of the, most, one of the key things is that this needs to function within a supported environment where to the most senior person in the organisation, the CEO who's sitting front and centre there, the most senior person in the organisation needs to want to know what's going on. They need to want to know what's happening and they need to really be involved and value the program. If there is a lack of institutional interest, it will wither on the vine. So a few years ago, this statement appeared in an article in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. It is increasingly recognised that an organisation's culture directly impacts on its ability to implement change and improve clinical outcomes. However, a number of years ago, it dawned on me that the reverse was actually true. 
that the implementation of a continuous improvement program along with the clinical standardisation, and I put there may, I would now say does, positively influence the culture of an organisation. This slide I prepared for a talk to the College of Surgeons in 2017, but I'm now convinced that the sustained initiative of a continuous improvement program has a massive effect on culture within, within a unit, between, but uh, in particular across an organisation, a very powerful positive influence. Features that make this work, aligned goals from the top down, patient-centred, critical fundamental knowledge in many areas, from ward clerks, porters, PSAs, to the most senior of clinicians and administration. Everyone in the process has some fundamental knowledge. Respect for relationships and listening to others, something that doesn't necessarily come easily in healthcare. Effective leadership in many areas, which is not a title. It's not something that is prescribed. It's something that is developed through the culture of the organisation and developing the respect for relationships, understanding what the goals are, feeling empowered to speak up, feeling empowered to take responsibility. We're in danger, I think, of, and I don't mean just within this organisation, but within healthcare in general, of becoming far too bureaucratic and far too compliance orientated so that we do not, we remove the empowerment for people to take responsibility, make decisions and change things. So that all that happens is everything gets escalated to the highest point with the belief that, okay, I've now done my job, I've escalated the problem, I have dealt with it. This is not a feature of a high performing organisation. This is a feature of a very stagnant bureaucratic organisation that will find it incredibly difficult to solve problems and make change. This is not organised along long formal lines of authority and it does develop, uh, depend upon interaction between many so-called units. There is no clinical, there is no unit and in fact, no patient journey through this organisation relies only on one division or one clinical unit. Multiple subunits and cross-division activities occur to make things happen. And so developing an agile organisation where people cooperate and the customer focus is helping each other, helping across true uh, unit or divisional lines. Patient focus is another thing, it's not customer focus. It's a subtle difference. Responsibility to patients and team rather than the clinical discipline. I often finish these presentations with this statement, the carrying out of routine means the difference between the success and failure of our organisation. So we could change correct and put quality in there and quality with its six domains. That's what we're aiming for. And that is, that is really the key to running an effective, safe uh, organisation that does produce quality outcomes. And part of that is efficient use of resource and creation of capacity. And by God, we need that in the current environment. By the way, this initial statement can be attributed to Hudson Fish, who was one of the co-founders of Qantas in 1922. Okay, I'm going to finish there. I think we'll hold any, any discussion or any questions over, but it is now my pleasure to introduce Peter Hibbert, who is known to some of you. I've known Peter for quite some time. He is the Honorary Associate Professor, or rather is a Program Manager with the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Macquarie University. He manages a $10.8 million grant researching translating safe uh, care into practice. And he is the stream lead for conducting appropriateness of care studies in the Institute Centre for Healthcare Resilience and Implementation Science. And Peter was the um, senior author on the CareTrack study 
or one of the senior authors in the care track study that was published in 2012. And he tells me he's now uh, doing another, you did care track paediatrics and now there's a care track aged care. Peter, it was a great pleasure to welcome you to, I would recommend you use that microphone yeah. and the single, the uh, press the button, the, yeah, the arrow right. button. Um, and Peter will be talking about implementation science. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much for the invite. Thanks everyone for coming and congratulations, Andrew, on the, on, on the week and Lauren. Well done, and Simon, everyone. So, sounds like it's been a uh, sounds like it's been a, a great week, and thanks, Rob, for uh, for inviting me to talk. So, I have a confession to make, and the confession is I get a bit confused about what's implementation science and what's quality improvement. So, um, so working through this has uh, kind of helped me, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to help you sort of tease out some of the some of the differences because we talk about it we talk about it quite a bit in terms of implementation science and quality improvement, and uh, there's lots of definitions around. Um, so anyway, that's part of the journey that I want to talk about today is is um, implementation science, understanding how it fits with continuous quality improvement. Um, I've co-badged this presentation with some other, other folks from Macquarie University. So Janet Long, Mitchell Sarkis, uh, Gaston Anolda and Stephanie Best, who've done a lot of uh, improvement science work at AIHI. Um, this is also badged with the University of South Australia. So AIHI is run by Geoffrey Braithwaite, Joanna Westbrook and Enrico Cuera. And we have, a, we have an interest in implementation science, digital health, a lot of work on uh, electronic medication management systems, artificial health, so in, uh, sorry, artif not artificial health, artificial intelligence in health. Not sure what artificial health is. Um, we've got a lot of NHMRC grants and there's about a hundred of us at the, at the Institute. And then there's a small group doing what Rob was talking about before, was it, which is our appropriateness work or our care track work, who are based in South Australia. So we've got a small team who are co-badged with the University of South Australia and, uh, and we live here. And uh, that suits me really well, because I really like living in Adelaide. So. so I'm gonna talk about why we need implementation science. I'm gonna define it. The historical context is, is very important because there's a different history from quality improvement and implementation science. And the differences in philosophy and action and what they're trying to achieve uh, still, plays out, still plays out today. There's a lot of convergence between the, between the fields as from, from what you'll see, but that the history matters. And then I want to just compare and contrast quality improvement and then provide some useful implementation science frameworks. So ones that we find useful when we're, when we're doing research and possibly we can cross fertilise with, with quality improvement. <coughs> and then I want to talk about what the two fields can kind of bring each other. Why is it needed? You know this, and I'll, I'll skip through it pretty quickly, but these are our two care track studies. So this is, at a population level, what's the, evident, what's the level of evidence-based care that's being delivered to Australians? And as Rob said, we've done a paediatric study and we've done an adult study, and they found 60% and 58% respectively um, of evidence being delivered in the Australian healthcare system to patients, and that's pretty similar and fits in with other smaller studies. So we just did it at, a, we just did it at multiple conditions, multiple healthcare providers um, and across states, but uh, very similar results. I'm not gonna go into, I'm only gonna go into one slide of the why, because the why is very long, but just to talk about that the volume of evidence now that's being produced in medical research is overwhelming. This is a paper from 2007, and the figures here will, will have changed drastically, I think, since then, as, as medical research has kind of exploded. So there's 11 systematic reviews published every day. And there's 75 um, RCTs published every day, okay? So the volume of medical research is just massive. 
What that means in, for, for clinicians, if you look at any particular specialty, is keeping on top of the evidence is nigh on impossible for individual clinicians to do. So, as well as the responsibility of individual clinicians, we need it to be the responsibility of the system of creation and production of evidence, dissemination of evidence and implementation of evidence. And we need systems to be able to get that evidence and embed it into the workflow of clinicians. And we just can't leave it up to clinicians to do it themselves because the, the, the process is overwhelming. And at the back end of that, at the health service delivery end, is where quality improvement and implementa implementation science fit in. I'll give you one definition, which is from Martin Eccles, who's quite a famous um, name in implementation science. It's the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practice into routine practice, and hence to improve the quality and effectiveness of health services. Still, there's quite a bit of overlap there with quality improvement with, with that definition. And possibly where, where we, I'll tease it out a bit more is the scientific uptake of research findings is where implementation science likes to, likes to see itself. This is a definition. There's lots of definitions with implementation science and it, it makes the, the, the field kind of hard to define. This is a definition for healthcare. Okay, so this is a healthcare definition around implementation science. My colleagues and I recently were at an implementation science conference, we ran a workshop, and there were mainly health people there, but there are also people from justice, uh, child development, international development, welfare agencies, welfare agencies for indigenous people, and a couple of other of those sort of agencies. So uh, international development, I think I said. So. Implementation science is not a healthcare field, it's a field for services where people deliver services to other people, okay, to improve their lives. That's kind of where it kind of where it sits. You would have seen versions of these slides, so of, of this diagram. There's another diagram that uses the nomenclature T1, T2, T3, and quality improvement have got similar, similar diagrams. But I just want to start teasing out where implementation science fits. So if we look at those bottom two boxes, it's around could a clinical intervention work, does a clinical intervention work? And we use efficacy and effectiveness studies to answer those questions. Using, using typical trial designs. Implement theoretically, once we've developed an evidence base around a clinical intervention, theoretically we then use implementation science practices to then implement it obviously into the health system and quality improvement. Um, at Macquarie, we, Macquarie University, we are involved in a large genomics grant. So it's basic science, but it's also, it's also implementation science. And one of, the, one of the questions around genomics is, um, does genomic testing in neonatal intensive care units result in an earlier diagnosis and therefore treatment for certain rare diseases? And there's been a relatively good evidence base being established around that, clinical utility studies, cost effectiveness studies. And then the work that Macquarie's doing um, is answering high level questions such as, is genomic testing used in line with evidence across the health system, so not just locally? And then also what health system interventions can maximise its appropriate use. When we're thinking about that word interventions in that, in, that green, in that green box there, we're not talking about clinical interventions. We're talking about things like decision support or audit and feedback or reminders on computers. Okay? It's those healthcare delivery interventions is where uh, improvements, uh, implementation science t seems to fit. There's lots of other questions they, implementation science tries to answer. So what's the variation of use, say for genomic testing, um, appropriate use across the health system? A really key question is what are, what are the barriers to, to its use systematically? What can be generalised or learnt from high performing facilities? And then there's this other question about how can we use individual studies and generalise that across the, across the health system? So they, these are all implementation science questions. We can bundle that up 
I'm oh, sorry. Um, the sorts of methods that we use are mixed methods. Um, it's typically seen as using lots of frameworks. And I'm going to show you some of the frameworks in implementation science that we use a bit later um, to explain implementation characteristics or the characteristics of implementations that, that are successful. We use a lot of qualitative research around um, barriers and facilitators, but we do actually use um, experimental and pragmatic designs. So we've taken them from clinical science, modified those, and we, we do use um, RCTs and, we, and related experimental designs in um, implementation science. Here's a couple of examples. One, of the, one uh, the top one, uh, colleagues of mine at AIHI have done a step wedge design, step wedge cluster randomised controlled trial um, on electronic medication management systems. Do they work? Okay, so this is uh, not just at one, one health service, but across health services, a number of health services in New South Wales, using a modified experimental technique called a step wedge design. Um, and another intervention that I was involved in in the UK where we did a, a, a two-year project to try and reduce central line infections in 200 intensive care um, units in the UK. Again, we use a step wedge design. So that was using research designs um, within, within implementation science. The other thing we get out of in implementation science is to say, what works at a, at a health service level? So this is results of systematic reviews of health delivery mechanisms to improve clinicians' compliance with evidence-based practice. So things like audit and feedback, local opinion leaders, uh, educational outreach visits. So these are these are Cochrane reviews or systematic reviews, and these are levels of uh, effect size and relative difference on these sorts of these sorts of interventions. Cochrane's got a, a subsection which is a which is really about implementation science, and it's called uh, EPOC, Effective Practice and Organisation Care. So it's less about clinical interventions and more about health service interventions. Um, and you can see issuing guidelines. Surprisingly, um, there is no difference with, with that. Um, so aggregating up some of the studies from implementation science gives you, these, gives you these sorts of results. One of the negatives about a table like this is that a, one of the kind of really core principles of implementation science is consideration of context. Okay, so in implementation science, you don't just look at the implementation, it's the relationship between the, interven between the intervention and the context in which it's delivered. And a table like this completely strips out um, context. Okay, so when you look at the 70 studies that have been done in audit and feedback, they've been done across the board in healthcare in really different environments, and that just makes a huge difference to your, to your intervention. So really the variability is probably the most important thing here rather than the actual percentage change. I want to also talk about a a simplified history of implementation science and quality improvement, because it helps us understand where the two fields are today. Um, implementation science has kind of got two, it's kind of got two um, origins, I suppose, and one is the behavioural or social sciences, and that's still, you can still really see that in the frameworks that implementation science uses today. And then also related to that was the um, the field of evidence-based medicine that developed in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So if we think about behavioural and social sciences, there's a lot of frameworks to explain behaviour within organisations, not just within healthcare organisations. Um, one of the first ones was Rogers, which I'm sure you're uh, uh, often familiar with, which is the theory of, theory of diffusion, where and we think about our own experience with technology and whether we are... Uh, um, whether we will take up a certain technology or a new thing that comes out 
um, where we fit on this curve. We, you know, whether we're uh, an early adopter or an innovator or whether at the late majority or laggard. So we're providing a, a behavioural and social science kind of explanation as to behaviours and why people take up interventions. And there's a heap of these. There's also the evidence-based medicine movement, you know, started really with Cochrane and David Sackett. And I also put Chris Salagi's name in here, who was uh, the inaugural chair of general practice at Flinders University, so in the, in the 90s, and he's no longer with us today. And he was the, also the, the um, he set up the Australian Cochrane collaboration. We then had people like uh, Alison Kitson and uh, Jill Harvey and other people such as Trish, Trish Greenhalgh and Richard Grohl, Martin Eccles, and they created what I've really termed knowledge translation frameworks and also changed research methods from experimental research methods to quasi-experimental that we use in implementation science. Rob's also alluded to the history of quality improvement and mentioned um, Deming and Duran and, and Schuhart. Schuhart in the 1920s uh, and other authors later in later last century. I've, I've put in Womack and Jones here, who are the, the authors of the Lean book that um, in about 1990. Don Berwick, Brent James, Paul Plessick and a bunch of other people they created, took some of these tools and created tools for healthcare around, uh, for quality improvement. Um, so it's got different, it's got a different history. So implementation science, you still see lots of behavioural frameworks. Quality improvement, you see this kind of operational research approach. Okay, so, and you still see that difference today. There's now lots of convergence between the two fields. There's lots of overlap, but the differences remain. Um, like with all models, this, this is both real and imagined with this, uh, or real and artificial because, because of that overlap does exist. Um, this is a bit tangential to my, to my um, argument, but I thought I'd throw it in there anyway, because I think it helps just from a historical perspective. Safety seems to come from another uh, perspective. Okay, so it comes from other industries, also comes from psychology, and over a period from the 1950s into the 80s and 90s. And uh, then we had a bunch of people, quite independently, uh, of some medical people like Lucien Leap and Jim Bajan and Bill Runciman here and Liam Donaldson, um, converted some of that, those safety tools into some of those tools we still use today. So it's interesting when you look at these three fields that they've had different histories and they look quite different today with, with some convergence because of their history. There's a lot of these diagrams around too. So where do, where do all these terms and where do all these fields fit? And um, this is reasonably helpful. I think this is, um, uh, I can, I kind of understand this and works for me in that health services research com comprises both of dissemination of evidence, implementation science, improvement science. There's overlap between them. There's overlap with quality improvement. Quality improvement fits with uh, health services research, but it's kind of out of there as well because it's operations. Um, so that's kind of the relationships between them. Here are some of the key differences that, um, that I've modified. Um, between quality improvement and implementation science. Both rely on an evidence base, you know, that evidence base that's been established from clinical sciences and benchmarks and you're assuming that guidelines exist. So evidence exists and then you want to do implementation on top of that. Where, they're, where quality improvement seems to add to that, quality improvement tends to also be used for really local legitimate problems that are not necessarily di strongly directly related to necessarily evidence. So things like long lengths of stay or waiting lists or complaints, those sorts of things. You know, it's, it's, used, in, it's used in that area as well um, and very legitimately and well done. Uh, quality improvement tends to be, but not always, focused on, um, on local practice because you can do breakthrough collaboratives across multiple health services. Implementation science tends to be more applicable across multiple settings. Quality improvement 
uses less theoretical models, implementation science gets off on, on theoretical models. And there's a hundred of them or over a hundred of them. I'm going to show you a couple today. Common tools, quality improvement uses those, um, you know, stakeholder tools and run charts and process maps, those sorts of things, operational research tools. Um, implementation science uses more hypothesis generating studies and some experimental methods. Quality improvement focuses on quality of care and delivering quality of care. Implementation science is also interested in the actual interventions themselves and creating a science around them. There is over a hundred of the implementation science frameworks. It's a really confusing field. This, um, what Nielsen did a few years ago, he had a look at a lot of the lot of the frameworks and tried to put them in their place in terms of what their function is. And there's three main functions. I'm going to show you two or three frameworks that I find really useful. So the first one, the first sort of model of implementation science is describing and guiding the process of translating evidence into practice. So these are step-by-step -step guides to, health, to help healthcare organisations work through a process to take evidence and translate it into practice. And it's a bit like that magic box that Rob was talking about. And the best example I've got is actually your eight-step framework that you use for quality improvement. There's a lot of these models around. This one is quality improvement, but it fits really well with the implementation science model as well. It gives you a step-by-step -step process of starting with a name, a diagnostic, and working through the intervention. There's a lot of models around there like this. They badge themselves as implementation science. This is good, as good as any, okay? So this takes you through a process. You can use this locally, or you can use this at a health service level, or you can do it at a multi-health service level. It gives you a really nice process, and you can put other frameworks underneath this. The next lot are around understanding and explaining what influences implementation outcomes. And there's some theoretical models and models that have been developed over time. I'm going to give you two models that we tend to use in healthcare. Um, one is the Paris model or the iParis model. There's two versions of this, one from 1998 and this, this version here. And there's a lot more to this model in the, in the papers, but it says that successful implementation is a function of the innovation itself, who's getting it, both individually and collectively, the specialty and the team and whether it's multidisciplinary, and then this context. And in implementation science, context is really, really important. The inner context, which is the microsystem, the health service, and the health system is the outer context as well, and how that's facilitated. And there's lots of information under, under, these, under this framework. And what this is useful for, it's also it's a process for undertaking implementation science projects. You can also use it as an evaluation framework. The theoretical domains framework is probably the most use, used implementation science framework used in healthcare by us and internationally. The, the, purpose, of the, the purpose of the framework is to, um, it's, a, it's got 14 domains and it's got a lot of other information underneath it. It's, the purpose is to describe barriers and facilitators to why people do or don't get engaged in um, evidence-based practices or even access to healthcare. Okay, so it's a barrier framework of people's behaviour. It's very much focused on people's behaviour. And I'll get back to this point later on, but um, um, which, make, which is really the difference between these implementation science frameworks and quality improvement. Quality improvement looks at the system a lot of these frameworks look at individual behaviours. Okay, there's a real difference here. And I think there needs to be a bit more blending of the two. The th it's a terrible name, the theoretical domains framework. It really is a, a I don't really understand from the, you know, from the title what it is, but it's a 
barriers and facilitators to getting involved in evidence-based practice or access to health services. It's used to, um, essentially if you do uh, focus groups or interviews with providers or clients, you can then take that data and use this as a classification framework. From there, from what you find, you can put in interventions, okay, based on what you find. We've used it for a lot of projects, which I won't go into it. Um, these other evaluation frameworks, I just want to very quickly touch on one, which we're using a lot of, which is realist methods, which was developed about 15 years ago now. Um, this is a really strongly qualitative um, uh, set of methods. It doesn't ask, does this clinical intervention work? It asks, how, why, for whom, and in what circumstances does this and does this not work? And it helps you work through lots and lots of qualitative data from clinicians and from patients, and it's very context dependent. I've been involved in, a, in an evaluation of using GPs in emergency departments, and we use realist methods to really tease out the circumstances, because there's lots of different models you can use for GPs in EDs, to really tease out when these models can be applicable and when they're not. So we use these statements called context mechanism and outcome statements to, to tease out what works and when. So we, we're using a lot more of these realist methods now in our research. So last two slides. What can quality improvement bring to implementation science? Quality improvement from its history came from manufacturing and it takes a really strong, uh, has some really nice diagnostic tools around trying to understand your microsystem. Okay, when you use your process maps and um, when you use um, nominal group technique, affinity diagrams, Pareto charts, all those sorts of things, really focus on the system. What quality, what implementation science does from its behavioural background, it tends to just, it, not just, but it often tends to focus on the clinicians and their behaviour and the patients as well, okay? And it doesn't necessarily get into that deep understanding of the process and the system. And I think what often, when you look at the papers, um, say when you're using theoretical domain framework, they often don't necessarily use that systems-based approach that quality improvement uses. The deeply embedded concept of the microsystem is really important for quality improvement. Um, I think implementation science, they've got some great diagnostics around behaviour and some great, and great evaluation models. But I think what quality improvement does really well, and I think is emphasised more, is using those small cycle tests of change and testing, testing, testing with individual patients and small numbers of patients. And I don't think um, implementation science projects do that as well and using statistical process control charts as a legitimate form of measurement, that's something that I think quality improvement can bring over to implementation science. What can implementation science bring to quality improvement and health services research? I think the, the importance of context. Um, they've got some great behavioural frameworks that, and there's, as I said, there's dozens of them trying to work out which are useful, but theoretical domain framework we find um, quite useful. We find realist methods um, quite useful as well. There's a number of evaluation frameworks that I haven't gone through. We find them really useful. Both of these frameworks to, to diagnose, guide and explain complex large-scale service interventions. And I'm thinking at health service level. So if you're thinking about uh, interventions such as hospital in the home um, and big discharge planning interventions that you're doing at health service levels, implementation science can be really useful. I think the other, um, there's robust quality, uh, um, qualitative and quantitative research methods that we can sometimes bring to quality improvement. I think the other thing is not at health services level, but at specialty level as well. Uh, Australia's it's got so many fantastic special, um, specialty based registries. 
and we do collect a lot of this registry data. And I think what implementation science and quality improvement's got to offer is potentially doing specialty-based collaboratives um, across states and across Australia to improve quality of care of those particular specialties. And I think um, implementation science has, has got a real role in using that registry data and then putting in implementation science on, on top of that use of that data. That's it, thank you. Turn this on. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'm glad you confessed at the beginning that you were confused by implementation <laughs> science because I must say I found it quite yeah. confusing and there's a, I mean, when I put up that slide about we, the knowledge base that we look at in for our specialty practice or yeah. medical knowledge or whatever it is versus the other side, the other side has so much in it that yeah, we really, that uh, you could do a whole, spend years studying. Yeah. Um, now look, I've got this unusual thing here of a whole variety of questions. Um, <laughs> sort of, perhaps I'll start from the simplest. Is implementation science the same as knowledge translation? Yeah, actually, I, I should have said that. I think so. So the Canadians, the Canadians um, use that term a lot. So of of knowledge translation, um, and I think they're pretty well synonymous. Yeah, I think. But again, there's lots of jargon in the area, so uh, they're they're as close as they can be. Okay, now there's a few quite curly ones in oh, okay. here. Okay, so maybe you can help. <laughs> so I'll start at the top. How does Salen address resistance to change in the improvement implementation context? So when you were talking about behavioural modification, I thought that the, I was thinking of a few areas that I could apply it. <laughs> but, um, Legal areas. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's a really interesting question, but it's sort of. It relates to that diffusion uh, graph that you described. Do you yeah. want to, going into an organisation and trying to institute change, have you got a comment about that? Um, I, th I think one of your comments um, uh, in your talk and also what we found with, we did a, um, Rob kindly invited us to do a, a review and an evaluation of the quality improvement program at Salen. So, and the, the reason this was done is silence quite unusual from the, firstly from the, the, the surgical and peri-op department to have a quality improvement program going for 15 years and now 18 years in Australia is a highly unusual thing, okay? So it might be normal here, but it's not normal out there. Okay, so and that's and that's worth that's worth looking at. So we spoke to some people, we observed some projects happening, and um, one of the so and we wrote a paper about that. Um, and one of the things that we we found, Rob, was your point around um, the the chicken and egg thing around. Do you have to work on your culture, and then you can start doing quality? You know, you've got to wait till you do quality improvement before you start working on your culture. Or is the doing of quality improvement, does that actually help change your culture? And um, it was one of the findings from our, from our review that, um, that actually doing quality improvement changes your culture. But then again, to do quality, to do sustained quality improvement, you do need leadership support, you do need a faculty, um, and you do need a method and you do need to sustain that. So it's, it's not quite as simple as just starting your quality improvement and then, you know, think your culture will change. You had the building blocks for many years in place to be able to sustain a really strong, robust quality yeah. improvement and program. And people often ask me this question. Yeah. And reality is that we started, we identified some early adopters and started with the early adopters and then we got some early innovators and then the early majority rather, and then the late majority, and we ended up with some laggards. But eventually the laggards either left or came on board because they became outliers. And it's a really quite strong motivator is people don't wish to be seen as outliers. 
while we allow and normalise resistant behaviour, it will continue. But when it becomes an outlier behaviour, then it start, things really start to change. But it's a long term, you know, it, it's not something that happens overnight. It's a long term sustained direction to get there. You know, you're in for the long haul, years, not months or weeks. I teach, um, I teach, I teach quality improvement external to this. and. We don't do it in house. We generally don't do it in house within an organisation. We've got people coming from all from lots of different organisations, and we do the course, and they, you know, bit like what you do in Salem. We pick a project, and they've got to do a project within their health service. And it's much harder for a lot of those people compared to when you do your quality improvement projects because they're often working from ground zero. You know, they might have been their first quality improvement project in their organisation. People don't necessarily get it. They don't necessarily have that strong support that you just see as, as now as just something you do naturally. And that's taken a long time and to to Yeah, I mean, that's the that. whole unsupported environment yeah. thing. That... Yeah. OK, so here we go. Can you elaborate more on the barriers in the theoretical domains framework that explain why people do not get engaged with the evidence base? Um, so this is the theoretical domains framework. Um, these, it's a question, why people don't... Yeah, more the ba can you elaborate more on the barriers in the theoretical domains framework that explain why people do not enga get engaged with the evidence base? Um, one of the, one of the, th one of the really interesting uses of this theoretical domains framework that uh, is less about providers and more um, around patients, it's used often for patients who come who are vulnerable and potentially don't access, service, access services that they might need. So things like um, men needing help or people with drug and alcohol issues, why they don't engage with services. This is a really nice framework to start talking to those sorts of um, patients in terms of why they're not accessing, accessing services. I'm not directly answering the question. So, but this framework is really useful for that group of people and as well as um, providers. Um, I mean, there's all, sorts of, there's all sorts of reasons in terms of why people don't um, engage with evidence-based practice. They um, we know that the guide, you know, from from that the guidelines are not necessarily well developed. They might not trust the guidelines. They think that the guidelines don't uh, apply to them. That their organisations um, different, and they often haven't had that organisational mantra that standardisation is important. And I think that's something that Salen's actually um, been really good at in terms of that standardisation is important and the more variation that you do have between clinicians, um, then you can't really control your outcomes. Yeah, so it's really interesting that for level one evidence or randomised controlled trial evidence, the average time from production of the evidence to relatively routine clinical implementation is 17 years. So, and that's a whole international phenomenon. The other really interesting thing in the, care, the Australian Care Track study, the adult study, was um, the, 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 on an average, 55% of care was, a, was delivered. It was a 50, 55, it was 57, I think, average. But in conditions where there was level one evidence and, or, and grade A or B recommendations made no difference. So the strength of the mm. evidence made no difference to mm. its clinical application, which I think was an extraordinary finding yeah, of that yeah, study. It was. Yeah, it was. So it's a re it is, it's sort of part of a human condition in a way. I was going, I made a, a note when you put up guidelines and it made no difference to care. So when we embarked on our clinical standardisation program, we very clearly marked protocols. And we marked protocols because we want, wanted people to either follow the protocol or make an active decision for clinical variation. And we wanted them to make those appropriate decisions because we knew that there had been this very strong body of research evidence that the mere production of guidelines and delivering that to a clinical unit makes no difference whatsoever. We'd actually managed to internally study that in a few of our programs 
where we had discussed guidelines at clinical meetings. We'd agreed as a group of clinicians that this is what we would follow. And we managed to get it right, to actually apply that evidence somewhere from five to about 40%. Five in a poor example, 40% in a strong example. So that's how effective this distribution and dissemination of guidelines was. It was useless. So it really needed something more of a force function to get people to think. Yeah, and we had resistance to that, but we persisted, and I think the persistence has been beneficial. Okay, so we go on to, and now we're really starting to get into the meat of it. How do we at Salon embed study designs like a stepped wedge RCT into our clinical practice and across our network to generate this level of evidence, or do we need to unite as a state, as a concept, nation, to undertake these types of studies? They're, um, they're highly appropriate to use across health services. So the, the, ones, that I, the ones that I cited were, um, for step wedge designs, were across multiple health services. And um, so, and they're really appropriate to use at a specialty level. Okay, so those, well, that one was around medication administration systems, the other one was around intensive care units. But um, step wedge designs for like, you know, different emergency departments or intensive care units or particular surgical units, Rob, um, um, or even allied health can, can be a really useful research design um, to get across a state um, to do an improvement project. Okay. Yeah. So that's something we could do across networks. Yep. Okay. Yep. Look forward to that. Um, <laughs> all right. So the, the same person, that I'll miss one out, but what's the level of evidence generated by a quality improvement study compared to an RCT? And how do we know what we have done has actually made a difference? Um, it's different evidence. So it's um, the what you're trying to generate when you when you're doing an RCT is you're trying to generate evidence on what works in terms of in terms of clinical interventions and what the the type of data that you're collecting when you're doing quality improvement is that what works around here and does it actually work around here and take or taking that evidence and saying how are we going, does it actually work around here? And it's, it's yeah. a different level of evidence. And, and it's, com it's com a completely different concept, which is difficult to understand at first, but with, a, with a, a, an RCT, a trial, the idea is that everything is the same except for one, one thing, and you're really testing whether that one intervention is making a, a difference in a, a population with a condition of some sort or other. With a quality improvement project, the outcome, so you, how do you tell you're making a difference? You have to measure the outcomes and, and that's sort of the closing the loop bit, making sure there are no unintended consequences that are harmful, etc. But the key about the interventions is they are quite specific to the microsystem that you are working in. Because the success or otherwise of an intervention will depend on all the other bits that, have, that are either exist or have actively been put in place. So if you've got 20 steps that, are, that you've sorted out and you add one more and suddenly you see an improvement, that one more won't necessarily work in, another, in some other system. It's in the system that you have designed within your own microsystem or your own microcosm. Mm. And that's, so Angie, you remember that day in the tier three when you asked the question, oh, what intervention had the biggest effect? And I, I stopped and I said, look, it's, it's not relevant other than for the specific project because it's so, it, it's so codependent. Now, I remember years ago with a, um, watching a presentation, this is when we were running the, the, the final graduation of a, pro, of a project, and I didn't really necessarily understand this, and someone, it was a project at Lyle McEwen about drug error, and I thought, oh, why don't we just do that intervention? And then I thought, hang on. The only reason that worked is because of all the other bits that had happened as well. And so it's a very key difference and a really important question to, to understand. Yeah. Okay, I think, 
Um, <laughs> this is interesting. Should Salen have five fields of inquiry, i.e. separate improvement from implementation science? I'll leave that to the <laughs> Professor of Research and Science, <laughs> Professor Burston. <No. laughs> okay. Does anyone yeah, in the audience have a question? So these are, I'm not sure whether you've, audience or people out there in the virtual world have been asking these questions. Does anyone have anything they would like to? Standing in that structure, so that's. Can you comment on? Um, again, I think it goes back to that argument about clinical autonomy versus standardisation. I think is you know maybe the the answer to 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 the, the question was about how does status you know potentially impact on on um, people's willingness to get involved with. Um, you know, interventions and um, and evidence-based, being involved in the evidence-based. And I think it's, um, it is around, the, uh, often our, our uh, when we go through um, our training, it is about making individual decisions. And, you know, you're taught to make individual decisions and so you should. But uh, often then when you work in the health service areas, there is a need for some standardisation. And to standardise um, by the patient, okay? Or you have individual, have individual, um, yeah. So I think it's that clinical autonomy and standardisation. So is what you were trying to say is that people who feel as though they might lose something because yeah. of the process don't wish to get involved. I think that, um, it's, it, takes a, it takes a bit of effort to convince people that actually they won't lose anything. And it's not as if they're losing power or any other, you know, that, that actually their life will get easier by being involved and making this stuff work. But yes, that, that is, a ver that is a, that in the real world, it's an issue. And one that we need to, you know, I mean, we can't pretend it doesn't exist because it does. Mm. Well, look, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so was there something? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Peter. Once you have implemented the change, mm. it's usually very hard to maintain or sustain that change. So what yeah. are your thoughts on that? I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It take, look, it just takes it, it takes effort and persistence. And look, we find this we find it in all fields. Um, we find it with safety. You know, you often you often do a big investigation. You start putting in, implementing recommendations, and then the next big thing comes along, and then you know the the first thing you've done degrades. So um, it takes persistence. It also ha requires just keeping the team going. Continuing to measure, I think, is a is a really important thing, and continuing to feed back the results to the team in the microsystem, the team at executive, and the team at management. And um, it's very easy for these things to to you know kind of fade away if you if you don't if you if you can let them. I think the key is if someone can go on holidays or leave, and the process keeps going, you know you've got a you know you've got a sustainable process, and it's not reliant on it's not reliant on Rob or Angie or you know Vanessa or someone like that who who is driving this who's driving this change. Yes, it has to work longer than a long weekend. Um, it's I, I agree completely with what, what Peter has said, but I think it's the importance of having in your structure, people who as focused it is, is the improvement stuff. Because they're the ones that really keep us on track. They keep monitoring, they keep looking, they do repeated, repeated audits, and that keeps us on track. So there is a whole, there is a whole rigor around sustainment that does uh, mean investment and having people whose primary role it is. So a uh, very good question. That's absolutely so vital. All right, we'll call it to a halt. Thank you. I think in 20 minutes time, we'll be back. Sorry? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. <laughs> Can we do it quicker than that? <laughs> All right, I see. OK, all right, thank you. Thanks very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today in, uh, in person here in Lecture Two at uh, Lecture Theatre Two at Flinders Medical Centre and online through YouTube and the Hoover app. Uh, my name's Simon Windsor. I'm the Manager of Research, Governance and Ethics. And uh, we've got a really exciting session on now. It's the uh, free paper presentation. So these are a range of um, improvement projects and implementation projects that have been going on at Salen. And we were inundated with um, submissions, which is really, really encouraging for us. We acknowledge the Ghana people are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains, pay respects to elders past, present and future. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Once again, we've got the uh, Hoover event platform and this enables you to ask the presenters uh, a question. And um, we've also got another question on for the final day, uh, where should we be in 12 months time? So you can pitch ideas of, of what you'd like to see or where you, where you think Salon should be and where you should be uh, in 12 months time. We've got the active research trail demo up the, uh, in the foyer and along level five there. And um, Flinders Foundation, they were very generous to donate um, uh, money towards prizes uh, for these uh, free paper presentations as well as the posters you've just seen. Uh, and we've got the polling via the Hoover app and there's a selection panel as well. And so in the app, it's the polls function there. So you can uh, go into the uh, agenda item for today, the free papers presentation, go to the poll, and then you've got uh, a very democratic sort of uh, above the line choice of one presenter to win the uh, prize. So the facilitator for this session is Professor Rob Padbury, Executive Lead of Continuous Improvement at Sala and Clinical Director of Surgery and Perioperative Medicine. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. I'm in great danger of overexposure here. It sort of sounds like a highly professional organisation, doesn't it? Streamed through YouTube and the Hoover app. It's highly impressive. Well done to the organisers. OK, so we now have a series of um, CIP type presentations and I'd like to welcome the first presenters Tracy and Ruth who are going to talk about barriers to met calls so welcome to the podium Thanks. hello good afternoon um, I'm Tracy and my colleague Ruth we're presenting on a CAP project that we did uh, regarding barriers to met calls. Um, our background is, hang on, we've got our presentation here. Is it just go next? Yeah. Uh, our background is in uh, patient safety in clinical governance and uh, we had identified through um, review of incident data that we were seeing um, some incidents related to delays in escalation of care related and wanted to understand better the barriers to met calls. Um, we have identified both from incidents and from cases that we've discussed at our clinical review committee that there were patients who were having an adverse outcome or an unexpected outcome that was directly related to a delay in emergency management or escalation and obviously we wanted to understand that a little better and the benefits of doing that would be to reduce patient harm. Uh, it's fairly evident that patients might be harmed by the delayed escalation and we've seen that in some of the cases that we've reviewed. Um, so we need to acknowledge as well that staff wellbeing can be adversely affected when there is an adverse patient outcome or an unexpected outcome. It also places the organisation at increased clinical and medico-legal risk and reputational damage. Again, it's fairly obvious that we were looking at all patients that are receiving care at Salon, and there were benefits to all from having a review of this matter. The cases that we've taken to clinical review committee, we sort of reviewed um, historically what we'd looked at over the past couple of years at that committee. We have previously identified incidents and done root cause analyses or formal reviews on cases where we've had a component of delayed escalation. And we've referred those learnings and those um, recommendations 
to the divisions, to the Standard 8 Committee and to the CNMER and TMO unit. The specific issues that we'd identified through those cases were escalation from junior staff to senior staff. Most relevant for this project was delayed MET activation for patients in MET criteria, um, a lack of escalation by junior staff following medical review, and a lack of recognition of abnormal blood gas values. Because we've identified this as a bit of a watch topic, um, we do have a bit of a closer lens on cases that might have this as a component, and if necessary, we, we have a normal process to take those through to our clinical review committee. As part of the preparation for this project, Ruth and I went back and had a look at some SLS incidents and SLS data. Unfortunately, there's not a one-stop shop, there's not a quick button that you can just pick a classification for delayed um, escalation. So we had to go back and sort of um, look through uh, a multitude of different SLS classifications to look at themes or what we could identify from delayed escalation. <coughs> and what we were primarily finding was that these were the key issues. There was disagreement between team members on whether or not a MET call should be made. There was a lack of escalation to seniors, an unclear plan of care for the patient, modifications that were either not written or not well used, Frequency of observations may not have been as required. Um, a decision, a delayed decision to escalate, <coughs> or just the busyness of the home team, in that there was a delay in getting the review of the patient. Oh, <coughs> that's, that's missing a bit. Is oh, it? here it is. And RDR, we did also had a look at the RDR chart audit that was take, undertaken in June 2021. And our key findings from that were that 10% of patients did not have appropriate observations recorded. 27% of patients did not get an appropriate escalation response. That is, of course, any escalation response and not specifically for MET. 45% of patients who did have an escalation did not have that outcome documented. And 38% of patients did not have a seven-step pathway or a resus plan documented in their notes. As part of the preparation for this, server, uh, for this program and <coughs> on the background of doing that SLS review, we decided to do a pilot study and we did a, a single page paper survey that we distributed to seven wards um, and we got 132 responses from that initial pilot study. We then shifted back to the CIP process with a plan to do our process mapping and what we found was um, we had uh, it was difficult to get attendance, as a, a lot of the people in the CLP program did. That's a contribution of just a combination of just the hospital busyness, um, COVID restrictions, um, room restrictions on how many people you could have in a room. Um, but we did get six people attend our mapping session, and I must say they were six very passionate people who, who all had very clear ideas in their own. Um, experience of what they thought might be barriers. But what we found was that it didn't match the responses that we got from the 132 um, respondents in the paper survey. So we actually felt that having that smaller group in the mapping session had sort of skewed <coughs> what we were finding. So we decided that the feedback we also got from the 132 people on the paper survey, the initial pilot study, was that people were, we asked people to um, did they want to be involved in this project further? Did they want to provide us with any other additional information? And we got quite a high response. People provided us with their email addresses and their contact details. But they did make a comment that they didn't either want to meet face to face, they wanted to remain anonymous, or they would prefer to just provide us, meet us one to one to provide the information. And as I said, we also had the restrictions in getting the bigger group together just with the busyness of the hospital. So based on those two factors, we decided to expand our survey. It was the same survey that we had done in the pilot study, but we, ex we loaded it onto SurveyMonkey and we distributed it much more widely. And we had over 300 responses to that survey um, and an overwhelming over 500 um, free text responses. That was a, a lot of rich detail in what people felt were the barriers to met calls. 
A summary of that is that 29 per cent of people said they'd felt uncomfortable calling a MET and 58 per cent said there were barriers to calling a MET call. 33 per cent of those said that there was a difference in attitudes or barriers to calling a MET either during hours or after hours. Um, now at this stage we haven't really unpicked that, that's probably um, might be a little bit more difficult for us to unpick. But I did think it was interesting that some people said to us it was easier to call a MET after hours because there were no doctors around, and some people said it was harder to call a MET after hours because there were no doctors around. So I think we need to unpick that one a bit more. <coughs> As I said, we had over 500 responses in free text comment. Um, uh, identifying what people felt were the barriers to calling a MET call. And the majority of those said it was the response from the MET team, the response from the home team or the senior ward staff, um, and then secondary to that, an unclear plan of care for the patient <coughs> and a fear of being judged if they call a MET. From that, as part of the CRP process, we created our fishbone. Lots of contributing factors in there, as you can see. And we came up with, I think, 10 main themes or 10 main categories of where people were identifying those barriers. Uh, what we decided to do then was to do an e email voting process rather, again, than doing a group session. So we had over 100 participants from the survey who had given us contact details. And we sent out our first uh, list of voting criteria, our identified themes through a voting process, email voting process. And from that we identified those top categories that we had identified in that um, previous slide. We're currently still working through our second round of voting, um, but the very initial findings from that are suggesting that the comments that people are making, it's about being criticised or made to feel silly if they call a MET. The response from the home team an unclear plan of care and the doctors already on the ward. And again, I think that last one needs a bit more unpicking because um, that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing, but we need to understand that a bit better. And finally, I thought it's probably worth uh, understanding, in the words of the people who were responding, just some of the free text <coughs> comments that we, they were that we were getting from this survey. And this is a tiny tip of the iceberg because we had over 500, so um, words in there are about feeling judged, um, not feeling supported, um, being told off, um, made to feel criticised. And then we get down to the issues of um, no clear direction or mixed messages about the patient care plan and um, not wanting to feel incompetent, so their own sense of wanting to manage things themselves. So that's where we are at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on, before you go on, oh. there's, there's no escape. <laughs> eh? So um, if you want to take the cultural pulse of an organisation, that's not a great reflection. Oh, I mean, so there were a lot of responses like that that um, being judged and being criticised by, it seemed the majority of it was the MET team and then it was the local doc doctors and then it sort of, there were other causes. But I must say that's surprising and disappointing mm -hmm. in, the, in the same time. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Oh, have I got this thing here? Sorry, I forgot that I'm technology rich and knowledge poor. And there don't seem to be don't seem to be any questions on this. Okay, one from the audience. There we go. Thanks. Uh, are you looking into the weekend effect? Any difference in the number of met calls over the weekend versus the weekdays because of the weekend effect on hospital yeah. outcomes? We hadn't Thanks. asked that specifically, other in the other than Just in the like general that. question about after hours and during hours. Um, but no, we didn't ask specifically about weekends. 
So once you unpick this a bit more, interventions are going to be that, that's an, interesting, uh, an interesting dilemma. I think if, you know, there will be several themes that come out of this, several key points, and I think for the purposes of this it will probably be, um, culture is always going to be a hard one to tackle, so it might be more about um, um, supporting staff or just... Um, <laughs> supporting a, a staff while they get abused. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's about you know a better plan of care, a detailed plan of care for the patient before the home team goes home. Something that will provide staff with some that level of support for the patient. So Andrew would like to make a comment. Well, so, so I guess it's going to start as a comment, but hopefully we'll get a bit more conversation for a second. I, I think it's a very interesting observation, and I'm you oops, must. thanks, and I'm perhaps not a surprising one. And I just recall many years ago. Um, that we had a, there was a complaint about an adverse outcome from a patient. Um, and when I looked at it, there had been about 21 episodes where a met call could have been called on that particular area. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's consistent with this idea that you have a, mm -hmm. a cultural negative. And the, the adverse commentary came from, that, from the particular team from that area. So actually, they had not recognised, I guess, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. wish, that you know, there were cultural issues in their backyard that, that led to this very late yeah. call. So in your commentary, do you know where, you know where people are from? Can they identify where they're from? And you, can you start to get pockets of good or bad? Or is it across the whole organisation? We didn't, we did, in the initial paper survey, we've got uh, obviously details of where we provided those. We simply went to specific wards. Once we put it onto SurveyMonkey, we didn't ask for um, identifiers or, or location but details. But for people that wanted to be engaged, we've got, and it's not just nursing staff, it's medical staff as well that have yeah. Yeah. commented. And I think, Andrew, your point on um, individual area cultures, I mean, we certainly got comments from some areas that just said we don't do METs. So. So that's interesting, isn't it? You know, mm. so just to try to understand. I mean, I, I think it's probably is a general thing, but it would be interesting even to learn from some areas that do, some areas that don't, yeah. and start to understand. Maybe that gives yeah. you some opportunities to think about how to take it further. Yeah. And I, I certainly, what we've also sort of seen through this is that concept of we don't call one because the doctor's already here, or we shouldn't call one because the doctor's already here that might be more than appropriate, that might be the most appropriate management, but I think that very much depends on who your doctor is. And if it's a junior MO in the middle of the night, well then, you, sh you know, I would suggest you probably should be airing towards a MET rather than um, local management. Yeah. So thank you very much. I mean, you've, um, you've pulled the, opened the can a bit, <laughs> which is a very good thing to do. Just um, while we're f finishing off, it is, some years ago, there was a discussion about introducing a thing called the Vanderbilt system to SA Health. And the Vanderbilt system essentially is built on the fact that they have managed to demonstrate a relationship between behaviour and patient outcome. And I think it's that that link has now very definitely been established. Mm -hmm. And that means, that means that this is exactly the sort of thing that we need to address. So thank you. Okay. Okay, moving on, Heather Block. Heather is an occupational therapist and a PhD candidate. You're a very busy person, Heather. <laughs> Implementing a behaviour management approach. Well, we've got some more work for you, as it turns out. In the hospital setting for individuals with challenging behaviours during acute, or recovery from, I guess, acute traumatic brain injury. That's right, so, thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, can you hear me okay? Beautiful. I'm going to skip across. There we go. Uh, thank you for that intro. It's been a really inspiring day, so I feel quite honoured to be here. Um, so I started this work uh, when I was a clinical OT, and now it's progressed into a PhD. So I'll talk a little bit about one of the components of my PhD studies around implementing that consistent behaviour management approach for people with traumatic brain injury, or I'll call it TBI for short, in hospital settings. 
So a bit of an overview to start with, you might have heard the terms challenging behaviours or behaviours of concern or neurobehaviour change and uh, these terms are essentially interchangeable and they are umbrella terms to cover a range of behavioural disturbances that are common after traumatic brain injury and these behaviours can be agitation, aggression, disinhibition, uh, irritability, uh, wandering and absconding and problems with apathy or initiation. And we know that challenging behaviours and particularly agitation and aggression can occur in up to 70% of patients in that acute recovery phase of TBI. Um, and that acute phase being the first sort of zero to three months of injury, usually forming the focus of neurosurgical uh, care and they're often in a state of post-traumatic amnesia during that stage. There's risks associated to patients who have challenging behaviours and that can include you know, um, risks of harm through falls or self-inflicted injury or risks of excessive sedation from medications. There's risks of harm to um, healthcare workers through workplace violence, um, destruction of hospital equipment. And we know that um, challenging behaviours or particularly agitation and aggression can impede um, rehabilitation treatment compliance and so has adverse effects on functional outcomes. And this subsequently has negative effects on the healthcare system where we see um, increased length of stay and admission costs associated with that. So we have the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality Healthcare um, Comprehensive Care Standards to um, you know, manage and reduce risks of harm to patients while they're receiving our healthcare and we want to try and reduce the use of restraints. And there is some um, evidence in the literature and in, in guidelines around TBI behaviour management and essentially it should encompass a consistent and comprehensive approach. Uh, it should involve regular assessment of behaviours um, we need to minimise use of restraints for our patients and treatment should start with um, non-pharmacological approaches prior to progressing to pharmacological treatments with medications given at low doses with low side effect profiles. But anecdotally, um, there have been inconsistent approaches to managing challenging behaviours across hospital settings and particularly with this population group often with limited or scarce non-pharmacological strategies provided and at times um, sedating medications being that first line management. Um, so there is a gap that exists in terms of in the literature and in clinical practice around the effectiveness of consistent and comprehensive behaviour management approaches um, for people with that acute stage of TBI in hospital settings. And so that's led me to this work which aimed to um, develop and implement a clinically pragmatic um, behaviour management approach for people with TBI who have challenging behaviours in the acute hospital setting. And then to determine if implementing that behaviour management approach uh, would reduce the use of restraints for people with TBI, would reduce the occurrence of code black security incidences, and would reduce the acute hospital length of stay and cost, and thereby improving um, patients' transition into rehab and their progress in rehabilitation. So this was an intervention study uh, with a historical control group conducted at two neurosurgery units and two hospital sites in South Australia. So eligible participants were adult patients who were admitted to the included wards with an um, acute diagnosis of TBI who also exhibited um, challenging behaviours during their admission. Data was collected, um, pros uh, was collected prospectively for the intervention participants through documentation in the medical records. And then we had co-black security um, incidences and restraint data verified against the safety learning system database. Um, hospital length of stay and admission um, cost data was obtained through case mix. And then we had um, a completed retrospective data collection for a group of historical patients that met the inclusion criteria and they formed that historical control group from both hospital sites. And then the data was analysed descriptively using SPSS and um, obviously we had ethics and site specific approvals for this study. 
So um, we spent a lot of time in the planning stage of this project, um, so we engaged the clinicians involved in the wards and the clinical leads and some experts from the um, South Australian Brain Injury Rehab Services and that was a really important component of the project to ensure that we developed a clinically relevant resource that staff would be keen to use and um, the uptake would therefore be high in terms of the implementation. When we got to the implementation phase, we did um, a range of education sessions and we engaged clinical champions with, um, uh, within the ward, two wards. Uh, and we also developed um, some online learning modules. So from the outset, we planned to promote sort of education on behaviour changes um, for people who have TBI and for people working with people who have TBI. Um, and so we did this in collaboration with the South Australian Brain Injury Rehab Services. Um, and so uh, it's a couple of modules around common behaviour changes after brain injury and then the acute management of behaviour change after brain injury. And these are available for SA Health staff through the digital media website. So the actual implemented behaviour management approach consisted of these three components. So the TBI behaviour scale and record is um, an assessment tool. It's adapted from the over behaviour scale, uh, modified into a um, usable medical record and um, prov provided um, clinical descriptions of behaviour change after brain injury and the severity of behaviours as well. We then had the TBI acute management of behaviours of concern protocol. So this was um, a resource that was, would guide staff's use for management strategies um, and it emphasised the importance of starting with non-pharmacological approaches. Um, and so some of those non-pharmacological approaches included things like assessing for differential causes of agitation, um, whether that be pain or sepsis. Um, modifying the environment, so it was a low stimulus setting, um, using reorientation cues and orientation strategy, um, a cognitive cues, familiar items, having family involvement and having sort of a structured ADL program with toileting regimes and structured therapy plans. Um, it also, this protocol also then listed um, medications for the pharmacological management side of things and so their medications were advised by the um, South Australian Brain Injury Rehab Service and their neuropsychiatry team and their consultants um, to, to ensure that the medications were specific for um, that acute recovery phase of TBI so that they were at low doses and would support a calm but awake patient to ensure that they um, wouldn't be heavily sedated, which could then impede their recovery from post-traumatic amnesia. The third component of this behaviour management approach was identification of lifestyle factors and individualised strategies. So this is a discretionary component that staff could choose to use in collaboration with um, family members of patients to really gain an understanding of um, lifestyle factors or habits and routines for the patient um, and then use uh, the, that form to sort of track trends in um, triggers or antecedents to challenging behaviours, as well as any warning signs of escalating behaviours. It could also be used to, track, to record any other individualised management strategies. So some patients had certain food preferences, they wanted to have a sweet lolly um, nearby, or they preferred music on or music off, um, or there were, you know, diversional activities um, and those types of strategies. Uh, and if you do want more information on these, on the implemented behaviour management approach, it is available on the silent intranet under guidelines, policies and procedures. Or you can email me. So in terms of results, we conducted fidelity assessment and which, um, you know, demonstrated a positive uptake in terms of use of the behaviour management approach for staff. So we saw most of the patients having their behaviours assessed with the uh, behaviour scale and record and all patients having um, received some management interventions that were listed on the protocol. The discretionary item around identification of lifestyle factors and individualised strategies we used with 41%. We actually thought that was generally good uptake in terms of a new process on the ward. So in terms of our results, we had 23 uh, patients with TBI in the intervention group who received the implemented behaviour management approach. And we had 74 participants in the historical control group. 
Uh, the demographic and clinical information for participants in both groups were comparable, so we had no significant differences in uh, those factors between the two groups. In terms of restraint use, uh, there was a significant reduction in the use of mechanical restraints for patients with TBI in the intervention group compared to the historical group. We had a trend in uh, the lowered use of pharmacological restraints for patients with TBI in the intervention group compared to the histor historical group, but that wasn't a statistically significant change. And there was no change in code black security incidences or one-to-one -one nursing on the ward between the two groups. Um, we had a significantly lowered um, hospital admission costs for patients with TBI in the um, intervention group compared to patients in the historical group. And we saw some trends in lowered um, length of stay and time from admission to acceptance for rehabilitation for patients in the intervention group compared to the historical group. So in terms of the impact that we've demonstrated, we were able to uh, implement a change. Staff took on board um, a consistent and comprehensive behaviour management approach with generally positive uptakes. They were motivated to improve this area of practice in the ward and two hospital sites. Um, we supported the national standards in providing comprehensive care to try and minimise those risks of harm and more comprehensive assessment and management strategies um, and reducing you know, use of mechanical restraints and lowered use of pharmacological restraints reduces that risk of excessive sedation. Um, we demonstrated some eff efficiencies with the lowered, uh, significantly lowered hospital admission costs and trends in um, reduced length of stay. Um, so overall, some generally good work that we're working on, but there's still more to be done. Um, there's still uh, a lot more we can focus on in terms of how we can provide more effective um, evidence-based behaviour management, particularly for this population group in the acute hospital setting. And I think some of the gaps that we've been out, we've haven't teased out yet, and it's the next focus, the final few parts of my PhD is to really explore those contextual factors. So this being around the barriers and enablers um, for stuff implementing effective and evidence-based behaviour management um, for people with TBI in the acute hospital setting. So over the, over the next, you know, six months, I don't like putting a time frame on it, but over the next few months, I will be conducting a, a range of focus groups. Um, so I'll be um, gaining information from staff who work in that acute hospital setting with patients with TBI um, to really tease out those barriers and enablers of what works well, what doesn't work well, and why that is for effective behaviour management. I will also conduct focus groups with the South Australian Brain Injury Re Rehab Services um, and gain their learnings around how they're managing challenging behaviours in that specialised setting and how that might be able to be translated to the acute setting. Um, I plan to interview family members with, of patients who have experienced TBI and gain their perspectives around what it was like having a loved one with a new challenging behaviour in the hospital setting and their thoughts around management in the hospital setting. And then I'll compile all of that data and code it against the IPARIS knowledge translation framework and then develop an implementation strategy for best practice approaches for behaviour management for people with TBI in the acute hospital setting. And I think that's going to be a really important um, process and it will be really interesting because, you know, we have the, um, it's a health challenging behaviour strategic framework, but I think this is going to really tease out more of that context specific nuances of what effective behaviour management looks like, what doesn't work well, whether that's around staff's knowledge, um, skills, education, training, culture, um, the physical environment of the hospitals isn't usually conducive to calm and settled patients. Um, so I think there'll be lots of opportunities for ongoing you know, future improvements and research. Uh, that's my references if you'd like some light reading. And I want to finish off by thanking the wards involved in this project, my supervision team, and of course the Lifetime Support Authority who funded components of this project. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank so you. that's very much an implementation it science. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> are there any parts there you think where using the practice improvement approach might assist you? Well, I actually started, you know, coming from a clinical background, I started focusing on a quality improvement approach. So, um, and that was working well, 
Uh, but I guess in, when I evolved into the PhD, you know, I was looking at more robust um, implementation design. And I think the thing that I missed in that part of the study around, you know, that I've just described is those contextual factors. So being able to process them, uh, evaluate the process um, of change to explain why the outcomes occurred the way they did. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm going to put my glasses back on. Um, what are your thoughts on the use of inconsistent terminology? Does this impact on providing appropriate understanding and management? This is a pet hate of mine because um, across units in hospitals, across acute and subacute and other settings, uh, we use different terminology for challenger behaviour, behaviours of concern, neurobehaviour change, change behaviours. Um, and then in the literature as well, you know, I'm looking, you know, publishing articles and the editors have preferences around, you know, behaviour change. So it's so inconsistent and I find it myself really confusing. So um, I think what would be helpful is having a very standard approach of how we define these behaviours in a less negative way, because I think challenging behaviour and behaviour of concern is quite a negative connotation. But also when you're working with a patient and you want to define what the symptom is you're seeing, we should just call it by that behaviour. So we're seeing agitation or we're seeing um, verbal aggression or we're seeing physical aggression towards others or we're seeing disinhibition. And the way that you would provide management strategies for disinhibition would be very different to, um, you know, f uh, verbal and physical aggression towards others. So I remember years ago, Felicity Birch undertook... Yes, she was involved in the grant for this. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> this has evolved from Very her good. days. So that, she, <laughs> was, she did a CI, CPI course in the Barossa in about 2010, I think. Yeah, Something so, like that. I mean, I feel like I have been working on this for my life and I probably can, <laughs> will continue to do that for, until well, I retire. It looks like a lifetime's so, work. Let's hope we All see right. some positive change. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good. Oh. I'm trying to handle a piece of paper and a heavy iPad beyond me. Um, the next presentation, uh, Dr Annapurna Nori. Welcome to talk about the CARE project involved improving the well-being of older Kauna and Ghana and Naranjeri women. Thank you and welcome to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? All right. I brought notes along because this is not my stamping ground and um, I might just wrap it on and then have to be carried off or something. So. Um, this, uh, the, the big research project also constitutes my PhD study, and I just want to acknowledge um, oh, the, uh, oh, what's it done? It's put all these, I hope this is not the whole presentation doesn't have this background because it's not meant to. Anyway, um, so my supervisors are Professor Moore uh, and uh, Prof uh, Warren from University of Adelaide, and in the middle there, you can see Dr. Odette. Pearson uh, from uh, Samri, who is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman. Now, in terms of my personal acknowledgement, uh, and as you keep reading through it, uh, I, I would do like to start by saying Namani Nainari Anapurna, which is how are you all, and my name is Anapurna. As you keep reading through my personal acknowledgement, I also want to acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of this land that we're meeting on. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and future and also want to uh, acknowledge any First Nations people who are either attending this or watching this online. That bit about not being an authority on Aboriginal issues I take very seriously. I'm often asked to come and talk about Aboriginal issues and I'm not uh, at all an authority or an expert, but I do value, respect and reciprocate um, the trust that I've been given in Aboriginal spaces and lives. So coming to this project and the background for it, so over 20 years of my clinical work in Aboriginal health, uh, what I observed, and I'm both a public health physician as well as a GP, and I use my dual skills in this space. Uh, so in clinical consultations with older Aboriginal women, what I observed was a very difficult life journey that they'd had and continue to have. Numerous health struggles, and I call them health struggles because it's much bigger than just chronic health problems. 
there was a lot of conflict that they faced in terms of needs. So they were trying to balance their own needs versus the needs of their family. And family is quite extended. Uh, older Aboriginal women look at, are looking after not only their grandchildren, but their great-grandchildren. They're the primary carers for their great-grandchildren and grandchildren. Increasing cultural responsibilities as they got older and wished to step into being elders. Lots of financial stresses and a frustration and loneliness. So this is what I observed. In terms of what other staff would convey to me, they talked about poorly managed chronic diseases and also not being sure how to support them. So the picture that emerged for me was that there was a general lack of well-being was how I felt would best describe their situation. That they had a sense of not being cared about or cared for. That there were numerous unmet needs. The care was very fragmented. So either we're talking about medical versus social, health versus social, or even within uh, the health, uh, that the care is fragmented along discipline lines or disease lines. That there was an unresolved grief and an increasing loneliness. So I had consultations, and consultations with elders confirmed that a lack of well-being was indeed a significant issue for older Aboriginal women, and we meant people over the age of 50. Um, three of the elders said to me that I had a reputation for doing things that community thought was important and uh, back in 2014 they specifically asked me to do this project. Consultations with Aboriginal health academics confirmed that the focus should be on improving well-being, not just focusing on how to improve mental health, how to improve chronic disease, diabetes, etc. And that it was actually important to understand the phenomenon and the concept of care. Consultations with Aboriginal primary care organisations led me to understand that there was indeed a need for a model of care. So in regard to the literature review, all of this will be quite familiar to any of you who's had anything uh, to do with Aboriginal uh, communities. That older Indigenous people have poorer health and higher rates of disability. There is quite a significant impact of, of long-term health conditions, including uh, on their mental health that those who have access are frequent and high users of both health and community services. There is a destructive role of colonization and it's interesting that the AIHW has said colonization is a risk factor for poor health outcomes. Many older people uh, are part of the stolen generations. There's an imbalance in retirement outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and women have added vulnerabilities on top of being Aboriginal. However, that's that usual bleak and deficit model, and that's not just so. There has been an increase in life expectancy, and we should celebrate that. But more importantly, what I think as a country we need to celebrate is the concept of, uh, and, and the idea of Aboriginal resilience, because it certainly has been there, is there. There's a lot of talk about the resurgence of Aboriginal language, of Aboriginal culture. There's a revival and a reclaiming. And that is the climate that I'm certainly working in. And also, uh, the literature review led me to understand that Indigenous methodology and research is an entity. So therefore, if we come to methodology, this is the map of Australia as I have learned to understand. This was the declaration of Terra Nullius which was really an effective whiteout with the emergence of a new world order, which was whiter in every way. So apart from the sugar, the flour, the language, the attire and the customs, leading to black disadvantage, disease, loss and grief. And very significantly that the voices have been silenced, the knowledge has been negated and their wisdom ignored. So any methodology in Aboriginal research has to pay attention to this. In addition to any of you who might be familiar with this um, uh, community and consumer participation in health research. It's a very interesting ladder. And right at the bottom, it talks about very low levels of participation. At the top is high levels of participation, including initiating the research by communities or consumers. And most of the rest research historically in Aboriginal health has been at the bottom end, when it should be at the very top. So keeping all of this in mind, the study questions um, were, what model of care can assist in improving the well-being of older Ghana and Naranjeri women? I particularly selected Ghana and Naranjeri because 
those are the nations with which I have worked with. That's the lands on which I have worked. And uh, it did not seem right that you just use the word Aboriginal because uh, it is a highly heterogeneous and multicultural society. And the secondary question is what role can primary health care services with a focus on Aboriginal health play in this model? There were three aims. The first one was to understand care and well-being. The second is to co-design a care framework. And the third is to develop a model of care to improve the well-being of older Aboriginal women. This shows the overarching methodology and structure. So it is a community-based participatory action research. The T in that is because uh, knowledge translation is an integral aspect of uh, the methodology and the project. The feminist research ethic uh, forces us to pay attention to um, power differentials, uh, to where the sit uh, researcher sit situates herself or himself, uh, and to pay attention to the epistemology and the people that we're working with. Indigenous women's standpoint particularly calls for sovereignty of, in, of indigenous women's voices and also specifically calls for knowledge generation and the way knowledge is looked at to be along the Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and doing. And if anyone attended or, or would like to watch the session on Wednesday, there was a lot of discussion about the Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and doing. The, um, we are working with older Aboriginal women, with Aboriginal primary care service, and uh, also uh, Aboriginal lead organisations. There is an Aboriginal uh, advisory group which provides the project governance. It has 11 members, four of whom are elders. There are only three non-Aboriginal people, um, and I say that with pride. Uh, and those three uh, non-Aboriginal people are there because of the positions that they hold and their participation in the advisory group has been sanctioned by the Aboriginal organisations that they work for. It is not only a cultural safety lens that the Aboriginal governance is meant to provide, it is also to respect, honour and ensure that the knowledge, the cultural protocols and the lived experience of the Aboriginal elders who are part of this project is paid close attention to. That first study aim that I talked about, there's three components to it, which is looking at the perspectives of older Ghana and Naranjiri women a primary health care services perspective, and also looking at the broader indigenous and social concepts of care and well-being. I'm just going to now zoom in more on the primary health care services perspective. And in regards to that, it is to understand care from the, uh, in, in trying to understand the care from their perspective, looking at the scope, enablers, limitations, and barriers. And there are two Aboriginal primary care services uh, this project is involved with. One is an Aboriginal community control service, the other is a state funded. One is urban, the other is regional with a remote outreach. Um, and the uh, specific uh, work we'll be doing with them and have been doing with them is staff interviews as well as a clinical file audit. And the rest of this presentation is going to focus on pre presenting to you some preliminary findings of the clinical file audit with one of those services. So this is my, the, the code book that was developed, and um, my vision's not that great either. I'm just gonna move this while I look at it. But I just want to, apart from everything else, one of the areas, because what we're trying to do is describe what is the care that this primary health care service gave to older Aboriginal women. And so uh, we looked at the, so when you can see EOC, we were in, interested in looking at the episodes of care also the type of support and the level of support. And in looking at the episodes of care, we looked at face-to-face um, -face as well as non-face-to-face. -face. And in non-face-to-face, -face, we also looked at direct care, which was about phone calls, um, you know, picking up prescriptions, dropping off medications to indirect, such as pharmacist review and um, you know, things like that. Uh, it's also defined as to what the level of support is, uh, which was routine, which is your standard clinical care enhanced, such as going to do home visits or going to do home visits and giving them depot medications, uh, being, uh, doing a lot of discharge planning, um, arranging for their transport, and in, t in case of intensive care uh, support, it was case management, staff-assisted transport to appointments, uh, as well as multi-agency dealings. The audit period was over two years, from January 2018 to December 2019. And um, I've all along been talking about women over the age of 50, and all of a sudden, slide says over the age of 45. And that was because in our consultations with older women, they specifically asked that the age be lowered to 45. 
And so it was again to honor their request. So uh, of the, um, in the software, we identified that there was 150 women, uh, Aboriginal women over the age of 45. Uh, 94 were excluded and I've provided the reasons. And so there were 56 that were included for a very comprehensive full clinical file audit. So what do we know about the women, those 56 women? We know that the age is, ranges from 45 to 80 with a median age of 56 that 55 out of the 56 had at least one chronic health issue, only one person didn't, and the median uh, number of chronic health uh, conditions per individual was four. And that's just showing you uh, the ballpark of, of what, where these diseases are clustered, which chronic health conditions they are. Again, not surprising, mental health is, is a uh, significant one. In terms of the lifestyle assessment, um, in 11 people, either their dietary, uh, their diet was either not assessed or incomplete. And so um, of the um, 45 that were assessed, 13 people had an adequate diet, 15 not. And similarly, if you look at the physical activity, it shows you that. So overall, um, again, this data is not surprising. In terms of risk factor assessment, um, you could see that about 71% smoke. 52.4% uh, had unsafe alcohol consumption, and 64% were using either one or more substances. In my clinical experience over the decades, these are crutches for people to deal with pain, whether it's physical or emotional. Again, this is just to give you a snapshot, an idea about the, about the women, uh, the number of medications, uh, the graph on the left actually maps out all 56 women. And uh, in terms of how many regular medications they were on, the median was five with one person being on 17 medications. Uh, DAA is drug administration aids and 60% of them were either using a Webster pack or sachets. Coming to the, uh, the, the, the real focus of what I wanted to talk to you about today was in regards to the episodes of care. I'm actually going to ask you to look at the lower table first. Why? Because I was doing this presentation very late and I flipped the tables around. So that one tells, shows you the face-to-face, non-face-to-face, direct and non-face-to-face, -face, indirect. And it shows you, and if you look at the total on the right, uh, it shows you that, and this is per individual. So over that audit period of two years, the minimum number of visits for one individual was six and another individual at 172 um, episodes of care over the two-year period. In terms of what type of support, uh, clinical, of course, that's what they're coming to clinical service for, so that was 100%. Um, advocacy was provided uh, in 70% of those, uh, for those women, and self-management support was provided for 96% of the women. In terms of level of support, uh, this is looking at routine, enhanced, and intense. Um, again, if we just total up right at the end, it comes, you know, you've, you've got the same total, obviously, six and 172. But the, this is just showing you the spread of how many encounters or how many episodes of care are there for enhanced levels of care as well as intense levels of care. And, th and that top part was for individuals. If we add up the total episodes of care for those 56 women over a two-year period, um, routine care was 1,447 ep episodes of care and totaling to 2,393 episodes of care. And if you look at the enhanced and the intense, that adds up to almost 40%. So almost 40% of the episodes of care provided to these 56 women were either enhanced or intense. This is mapping out again at that individual level, showing all the 56 women, giving you an idea about routine, enhanced, and intense. And I did make a few notes to myself uh, just in that. Um, um, and the thing that I, I also want to highlight here is that um, six women out of, out of the 56, six women received only routine care, which means that 50 women or 89% received some level of additional support. Um, also, 50 out of the 56, or 89% of the women, received enhanced care, and 31 out of the 56, or 55% of the women, received intense care. 
This is again just showing you just another uh, picture of uh, what that level of support looks like. So these are all of those 56 women uh, with all the different color um, codes along with that. Up to this point, I've been trying to quantify the care in different ways. And I just want to finish up with um, trying to provide a slight more qualitative angle to it. Um, and this is some excerpts from notes. And I've chosen shorter ones. Um, this is for, from one patient file. The RN says, social support money stolen this week at hospital when she was an inpatient called Anglicare will provide food. Has food now, does not get paid for another five days, very thankful. Has been feeling stressed about surgery for next week. Told her if she needs to come to, to clinic to talk, um, but also said we would give her a reminder. The Aboriginal health practitioner has put a note, separate note, phone call from Coles down on Beach Road, stating client has left a medication down at Coles, called client, no answer, called client's granddaughter and then her daughter and left a message with the daughter. Another one, patient phone clinic, as she was unable to open medicines she had got at pharmacy, the Aboriginal health practitioner and I visited to try to assist. The issue was the pharmacy had placed them in a secure box, but not advised her she needed to go to the front counter to have the box open on the way out. We took the locked box back to the pharmacy, had box unlocked and then returned medicines to her and provided spacer from the Aboriginal family clinic and education about each medicine. Phone call from Terry White, chemist on Marion Road. Client hasn't picked up a month's worth of medications. Phone to daughter, mailbox is full, could not leave a voice message. We'll do a welfare visit. And separately, the Aboriginal health practitioner says, responding to client's son, carer phone call. Son very worried about his mother's vague actions. I attended the client's home with the, with the RN to see if we could assist in any way. South Australian Ambulance Service was there, one female worker in a small SARS vehicle. The SARS worker informed us the client did not want to go to the hospital. Both the RN and myself encouraged client to go to the hospital and she agreed to go. Waited with client for the SARS transport vehicle and we left at the same time as the SARS. Natalia, we just thank you. And the last slide I'd like to leave you with is a poem that one of the three elders who asked me to do the project wrote. Uh, this is from the Cole Brook Blackwood Reconciliation Park. It's there as a plaque. And she used to recite this to me. She was also a patient of mine. And every time she visited me for over four years, every visit with tears, she would quote this poem to me. It says, we are the stolen children who were taken away, torn from our mother's breasts. What can a child do? Where can a child turn? Where is the guiding hand a child is meant to have? Thank you. Thank you very much. So where, where are you progressing with so this? The, uh, in, in terms of? So where, where do you continue? What are the next steps? So um, we've got to finish off the analysis of the interviews with, um, with Aboriginal women themselves. And that's what's going to inform developing a care framework. And then the information from the two services, which is all the staff interviews, the clinical file audit, as well as the care framework in consultation with the Aboriginal Health Council of South Australia will be used to develop the model of care. Okay. So we have one question here. What can be done to accelerate decolonisation in Southern Adelaide? Um, start with yourself. Um, I think every one of us needs to decolonise ourselves. And I say this with the utmost of respect, um, and I also understand this about my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues, that they also need to decolonise themselves. So I think we as a nation need to, and I think if each of us takes that responsibility, it'll happen. All right. Any other questions or comments from audience? Thank you. Thanks very much, Senator. Okay. Um, Brioni Francis and Nicole Fisher. Allied Health Essential functioning cri Functional Criteria for Discharge. Certainly something we need. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, this is a sort of project that we started um, 
way back at the beginning of 2020 um, when life was a bit different um, and uh, it was a bit of a challenge to get this sort of uh, piece of work started um, as we were managing and dealing with the pandemic but we kept going. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge the, the different people that have helped us work on this piece of work. Um, there's been a number of us sort of leading the project over the last or oh, nearly two years now. Um, but particular acknowledgement to Jane Basham, who was um, the facilitator of this uh, initial piece of work through the CIP. Um, and then any of the allied health um, teams that we've been working with um, and engaging with over the last 18 months. So just as a bit of an overview, I'm sort of going to touch on what we did in 2020 as part of the framework of the CIP itself. Then what have we done since then? And where are we going to next? So most of you will probably have seen that there's the CIP framework that we work towards. Um, we spent, or are still spending lots of our time in breaking down the problem, defining the problem. Um, but we have sort of moved into some intervention planning and implementation. So the background is really about establishing what our problem was, which was around the inconsistent identification and documentation of essential functional criteria for discharge, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and I'll abbreviate it, I won't say those abbreviated letters, but that's how I'll abbreviate it moving forward. Um, and the initial scope of the work was really from the identification of allied health need from any discipline um, to the documentation of initial assessment. Um, and that was in patients over the age of 65 in the ED um, and in uh, extended emergency care unit. Is it a problem worth solving? Absolutely, definitely. Um, there was some really great, um, a great piece of work that Jess Stott had done around long patient stories and um, reviewing case notes. And you know, there was a particular patient story that we gleaned a lot of, um, which who had a 104 day admission across Salen, um, across acute and gem um, wards. Um, but what that did um, was identify that there was lots of multiple assessment points, particularly around allied health documentation, um, with no clear discharge criteria. Um, and so without that discharge criteria, there were serial assessments um, and unclear goals of care and lack of patient shared decision making. It wasn't really clear exactly what the patient wanted in that. There was lots of documentation about what the allied health clinicians thought that the patient might want or need. Um, so that gave us some great information. There's also research around how much iatrogenic functional harm is done when you admit older patients to hospital, which I guess, given the focus in the ED department, was something that we were keen to address, um, with the acknowledgement that home is best um, for patients. Anecdotally, we'd had lots of people sort of talk to us about, well, what is baseline? Like we, allied health clinicians often talk, talk about being back at baseline, and that doesn't necessarily mean anything to anyone else. Um, so that's not clear, even within allied health, let alone outside of allied health. Um, and the acknowledgement that discharge planning is actually becoming a far, far more increasingly complex beast, um, and it needs to happen from the point of first contact. What do we use to inform our direction? There's lots of different policies, procedures, um, and these kinds of things around the place. Um, obviously, the comprehensive care standard, um, particularly around establishing and developing a, a, comprehensive, goal, a comprehensive care plan with the patient, um, but particularly around the SAL and shared decision-making guideline, like actually working together with our patients and their families about understanding what their needs are So to start with, we did a bit of a baseline audit because we needed to actually test that we weren't, like we thought we weren't writing these things, but we needed to make sure that we weren't before we embarked on a piece of work. Um, and basically that's just an example of the fact that we hadn't established um, any discharge criteria in our case notes at first contact. Um, and in fact, the only time we actually wrote any discharge criteria is when we could actually discharge the patient at the time of first contact. Then we did lots of brainstorming, lots of conversations um, with our allied health colleagues. Um, high variability in the understanding of each of the, con like each of the terms within the concept. Um, even within allied health, what, what does functional mean? That's still something that sort of comes up again and again. What do, what do we mean by function? Um, 
and we tossed around, you know, what's essential um, and being really clear that, you know, we're a finite resource and we can only do a certain amount of stuff in, in an acute setting and so that we need to be really clear about what it is that we can do um, to, get the, to get the patient to their home um, as quickly as possible because that's where they'll do best. Um, and there was lots of conversations about how and when and who and all that kind of stuff around the documentation. So the definitions of the terms that we landed on, um, which there was a couple of iterations on that, but um, essential is the minimum requirement for safety. Functional criteria is pretty much any time that allied health needs to be involved, but around the physical, cognitive, nutritional and social um, aspects of the patient, um, patient's care and getting home. And discharge in this instance is discharge from Salon to a final destination. I won't go through all the details, but there was lots of different things that were barriers to the documentation um, of functional criteria. And then we did a Pareto and decided to tackle the lack of coordinated space to write all the criteria and standardised protocol on how and when to do it. We also did a bit of a snapshot audit where we had a look at the documentation and then those documented notes, we actually went back to the patient and asked them, did they actually know what their criteria was? Because if, it, if, the, if the patient doesn't know it, or the patient, if it's not an issue worth solving, sorry, so again, it's only an issue worth solving if it's a problem for a patient. Um, and so what we, and very small sample size, acknowledging that, um, is that when we actually had documented that we'd talked about criteria with the patient, they actually had more of an understanding that, that yes, they knew what they needed to do, at least from a functional perspective, um, to get out. Um, but certainly if there was no criteria completed, they definitely didn't have any idea about what they needed. I'm gonna hand over to Nicole to talk about the next bit. Um, so I guess following the formal CIP program, um, as Bryce said, we set out to address the, the key problems that were identified. So we developed a common pro forma for Allied Health to document on, um, and we also developed a workflow process of um, how and when to actually document. Um, so this included, I guess, an inclusion criteria of any patient that Allied Health are seeing, um, and it excluded um, patients that their medical prognosis was unclear, um, criteria were unable to be completed due to cognition or um, availability, but that it would be completed when it was appropriate with the patient or, or care or family. Um, and it also excluded any patient that allied health discharge on their first um, visit, I guess. So we trialled in March of this year in the ED allied health team, um, the form, and we, I guess after a couple of PDSA cycles, we embedded it into our practice in that particular team in about May. Um, we have repeated an audit um, since, which I guess showed that um, our, uh, I guess we ha are completing the criteria more with patients after the trial. Um, and I guess, again, for those ones that we have um, completed it, that um, the patients are aware of what they need to be able to do to, to get home. Um, so I guess this was just the initial pro forma that we had developed. We want it to be clear and simple and easy to use. We also didn't want to duplicate any other documentation that we'd already been doing for Allied Health. So this was the combined document. Um, so any Allied Health would document on this. And just the pro, uh, the the workflow, so again, simple and easy to use with the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, I guess where we are now, um, we're trialling the concept in GMF5 at the moment, um, and I guess the main goal here is to determine if this concept will work in an admitted pathway, um, not just the ED pathway, acknowledging that they are quite different. Um, we, I've, I guess with that, we socialised the, the idea through Allied Health and via the, the Allied Health managers. Um, I guess through this as well, EMR has happened, which has meant that we um, need to change our documentation process. So we developed an acronym expansion using an Allied Health note. So again, it's still combined. Um, but I guess that's where it's um, changed a little bit as well. So. The actual concept um, and using it in our communication, we've um, 
the people that have trialled it have said that you know it is fundamental in our communication and it is easy to do once you, once you know how to do it. Um, but I guess it's that combined documentation that we found to be a little bit trickier in an electronic system. So that's what we're kind of focusing on at the moment um, and the trial phase kind of in the, this month that we're currently in. Um, I guess Bri and I are also part of the Total Quality Care Goals of Care stream and Bri is on the steering committee for that. Um, so she has presented, I guess, what we've done um, from an allied health perspective and how that kind of con contributes to the Goals of Care stream. So what will we do next? Um, I think across allied health we've really agreed that the concept is, is a valid construct, um, but actually operational the operise, yeah. doing in practice is actually um, much more difficult. <laughs> um, those words look great when you put them up on the slide, but perhaps not great to speak to. Um, actually doing them in practice is a quite difficult. Um, so if we can get it across the line in GMF5, the plan is to roll that out to all of general medicine. And then if that works out, then, you know, we just keep rolling it out. Um, I think as alluded to in the, in the Met um, presentation, like culture change is really hard and actually this is what this is about, it's a culture change piece um, because I certainly didn't want to land on a document that was going to be the driving force of how we would do this moving forward. Um, but it's what everyone keeps coming back to. Um, it's really about how we can communicate with our patients and with our colleagues about what's a patient-centric, meaningful um, uh, conversation to have about where they need to be and where they need to be going next. Um, so that's actually really hard. Um, and measuring the impact is really hard. Um, so we've done different snapshot audits about telling, do the patients understand what we're talking about and those types of things, but, and we're trying to establish adherence to the actual, con uh, the actual concept, um, but things like PREMS, um, clinician reports, documentation audits, they might prove useful. I suspect, but don't know, that length of stay or um, bed days are unlikely to be sensitive enough to know whether this is going to have a big impact around that, but I guess time will tell. We certainly think um, it's got the potential to improve patient experience and understanding, um, and we hope that it would reduce the need for multiple allied health assessments as it goes as a patient goes through their um, journey with us. Um, and I would hope that if we're doing less assessments, that means we could do more intervention, which would be actually where allied health, I think, can add the best value and best bang for buck. Um, We've actually, we actually know anecdotally that it improves clinical handover between clinicians um, within the same discipline at least. It's much clearer. We've got an increasingly part-time workforce. It's actually really helpful to have a really clear, and under clear understanding about what the patient needs. Um, and certainly we can use that communication as we're talking about discharge planning and huddles and, and that kind of stuff. And if we've got some key terminology that we can use across um, allied health, that may well help. Um, and I think the next piece we really need to look at once we can sort of identify that we can do it in allied health is how do we actually make sure the patient knows and has some documentation about what that looks like. So that, that's another piece that we recognise we need to do. So patient-centred care is quality care. I think if we can provide quality care, we can get better flow through the hospital. I, I, you know, I think um, it's really important that we focus on the quality. Um, good communication is key and words matter. Um, how you talk about stuff really matters and we have spent so much time defining the key terms and it's actually been quite difficult. Um, but they do matter um, and that this type of work is not very simple and it's quite challenging. Um, that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't do it. Um, so I think that pretty much sums it up. Thank you. So there's a lot about documentation. There is, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> How does that translate into action? I think at this stage is that without having some way to embed the thinking into practice in a, a tangible way, um, we, we're not going to get the change that we actually want. But I would actually rather see it as a communication piece about how we talk about this with others, but without the document people, like when we've taken it out to the clinicians, they've really felt like we need the document to do it, to okay. drive the change. Which All right. 
Um, maybe. Maybe. But can you relate uh, discharge delay to the lack of a, uh, documentation of functional criteria? Uh, certainly in the patient, long patient stories, there were cause, well, one of the theories that we had was that in that particular story is that there wasn't any documentation clearly about what the criteria was that the patient needed to meet to actually go. Um, whether we can link it more broadly, good question. Yeah, I mean, so I guess what I'm concerned about is you're getting buried in documentation. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure whether you've established a link between that and actual and, and action, and uh, do it, dealing with whatever needs to be dealt with to allow discharge. So, can you identify a cohort where there is a clear link between lack of action, if you like, lack mm -hmm. of assessment of functional needs, and discharge delay? I could take a guess, but I don't have, I wouldn't say I've got data to say that I No, no, have. but I think you sort of need to focus yes. this down a bit. Yeah. Because um, merely having more and more documentation that doesn't translate into anything yeah. is not really no. my definition of quality. No, uh, I, I, I totally, yeah, totally okay. agree. Um, and every time we try and take it away from the documentation, the clinicians actually <laughs> drag us back into it. And, that, and that's where it becomes, it has really become unstuck because we've had multiple conversations with clinicians um, at different forums across the last 18 months. I'm saying Jess up there nodding. And, and it, they, they get fixated on how do we document this? And I'm like, actually, it's not about how you document it. It's about how you talk about it. It's how you think about it. It's about translating it's the culture of not assessing patients based on what a clinician needs for them to do and making it about what the patient needs to be able to do. And that, whilst it sounds very simple, is actually very difficult. And so they, maybe yeah. you need to turn it around to that, yeah. to actually focusing on what the patient's needs are rather than the clinician yeah. saying you need documentation. It's just, yeah, it's just I'm, I'm a bit worried that you're getting lost in, yeah. in this morass of documentation. Yeah, we certainly don't want to be and there. You're running sort of down rabbit holes, whereas you're putting a lot of work and a lot of effort into it. And, it, and I think, I don't, it's not that I don't think it's worthwhile, it is, mm. but I think you need to identify a cohort where it has obvious impact. And yeah. sorry, I've dominated that discussion a bit too much. <laughs> there is, uh, what are some functional examples of, or sorry, what are some examples of the functional criteria for discharge is a question. <laughs> you probably. Um, I, I guess that could be, it's very different across the, all of the disciplines, but that could range from, you know, just an example from physio that then they could be one light assist with a rollator frame 10 metres to get home because they've got family support that, that can provide that. Um, to, um, they need to be able to manage um, like a modified diet or they need to have certain nutritional requirements. Um, they need to be able to have um, you know, an ACAT for permanent placement. So it's, it's quite a range of different things and that's where I think the clinicians um, have, I guess, learnt a lot um, at really nutting down as to what the functional criteria is for their discipline um, and that's been, a, that's been a journey as well. Because it can be quite simple for disciplines like physio and OT but a bit more difficult for dietetic speech and, and social work. So you can have a look in the Division of Surgery at patients who've suffered complications. <laughs> a very fertile field for examination, one feels. <laughs> All right. Not that we have many of those, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So, Bruno. Ah, enter stage rear. Uh, Bruno Radisic is the head of uh, gynaecology, and he's presenting a talk entitled Let's Fix It, which has sort of a double meaning, huh? <laughs> All right, welcome, Bruno. Hi, everyone. Uh, two presenters, um, Kylie Mills and myself. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Kylie, I didn't <laughs> deliberately leave you. No, that's fine. <laughs> I had tunnel vision. <laughs> um, okay. 
All right, um, we can start. Uh, this was presented just at the recent CIP project that was just completed. Um, basically, what we wanted to see here is that there was a problem with the colposcopy clinics um, uh, being basically overloaded with patients with the, uh, with the current changes. Well, in 2017, there was a change in the guideline. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, there was a change in guideline in, um, in categorization of the patients for colposcopies. And basically, the number of patients that would need to be seen according to new guidelines has, has increased significantly. And this is what's caused us a bit of a problem with our, our work capacities. Um, so we didn't really know what, what's happening and how to um, optimize the clinic. So what we decided to do is then go into the CIP project um, to do that. Um, so what we started to do first is looking at the baseline information to see number of referrals that we are receiving and how much they have changed since the change in guideline. So looking at this, you can see that we stable, normally had around 700 yearly referrals, but that has increased now to about 1,200 uh, referrals um, a year. Um, and as you know, we don't have more staff than, than what we normally do for the work we provide. Uh, we can see on, the, on this graph here that there was an increase. Uh, I don't know if it works. No, it doesn't work. Sorry, there was an increase in category two patients over time, and we weren't sure whether this happened just because of change of categories, or it happened because the patients weren't seen in their regular time, and they started to be upstaged because of that. Um, so, first we started to look in the wait listing from, from electronic records. Um, we see that there was a 700 people on the wait list in January this year, and this was exceeding the expected, expected normal uh, waiting time. Categorization goes category one, two, and three. <coughs> category one, which is the most uh, important one to be seen within four to six weeks. The currently, we're seeing them in six to eight weeks. And then category two was up to nine months, and category three uh, was even longer. I must say that at the last count, before we started the project, category three patients weren't even being able to be, to be categorized on a waiting list because it was waiting too long, and they started to be sent back to the GPs, which wasn't really uh, part of the guidelines. So it's starting to be a bit more dangerous actually for us to, to try to manage that. Um, so we seriously needed to, to do something about this, uh, about this colposcopy problem. So we started into the, um, looking into consumers who, who, who um, utilize our services. And I think Kylie can, can talk about this part here a little bit. So we started with just looking at how many complaints were coming through to the area to get a snapshot. There were sort of only three, but we sort of had tacit knowledge that there was a bigger issue than that. So we um, started just a QR um, survey monkey in the waiting room and just started to get some real qualitative sort of information back from the consumers. Um, one of the big ones was I'm waiting a very long time in line um, and I you know, can't get through on the phone calls. So we got some good information there. All right, so we then started to look into the, into the numbers of patients who are waiting on our waiting list uh, from categorization one, two, and three. And you can see that basically category one, we had 11 patients uh, on the waiting list more than they should be waiting. Category two, 200, and category three, two to five. So over, in total, there was 507 women who were not seen within the guidelines that we should be, should be seeing them through. Uh, okay. Um, so I think it's me to the two, yeah. So uh, looking at the manual data extraction from the EMR, uh, according to doctors, um, we looked in this in the colposcopy to start with because we only have uh, three doctors looking uh, working in this clinic, so it was easier to manage and easier to see what was happening in the clinics. So on average, uh, the colposcopy was booked to see um, about uh, about 10 patients in total, six new and, and four reviews in total, but they were booking more patients in the clinic because there was expectation that number of patients will not turn up. So they ended up putting 12, 13 patients in the clinic um, to do that. So on average, what we looked at it uh, was the data was showing that about 30% of patients were not turning up to the clinic. Um, so we started to really know, anecdotally, this is what was happening, but we needed the proof that this is really what is going on in order to see um, how to do. And you can imagine that, you know, four patients on average not turning up to the clinic means that those four patients have to be rebooked, recalled. The admin will have to double handle everything um, all the time. Um, yeah, so. back again, I think. Yeah, it's backwards or forward. 
Uh, so then we wanted to delve a little bit more into consumer feedback. So we really were able to ascertain that um, admin won't call a patient unless their appointment is within a two week period. Otherwise, it's a standard letter that's just generated out. So um, there was sort of that, there was no feedback loop built into the system to find out if anyone knew about their appointment and were planning to come to that. Um, keeping in mind then that there was about a 30% over one hour wait to get through on the telephone line. So you get that letter, you can't come, you try and ring an hour, you know, and it continues as a cycle through that. Uh, so we got together and did some process mapping um, and one of the quick things we noticed was the line was going up and down so it was handled back and forward, back and forward, um, right through the referral process. There was a lot of variation in how a pro uh, referral was processed, um, including the Women's Health Clinic over to the um, Cancer Clinic um, and things like that. So we really started to see some of the issues around just the process itself. Dived into some direct observations, so really just spending a few days down there to really see what was happening and really themed them around workflows, EMRs, layout, staffing and bookings. Uh, also created sort of a, a tally sheet to understand um, portfolio staff and what their role was with colposcopy within a speciality service that has about eight specialities down there to try and find out the cadence of their week, how are they approaching their workloads um, and how, how does colposcopy sit in that workload. We also then just wanted to myth bust around the phone call, so um, spent time ringing on every internal line and external line to really find out how long each of those phone calls do take and which ones do answer and don't answer. So it really gave us a really good picture of um, what was current state. Yeah, so we decided to see how to progress from here. So we thought that um, what we want to achieve is to reduce the uh, failure to attend rates from 30% that currently was happening to down to about 15%. So we want to half it, and we thought that this should be um, achievable. We weren't sure, but we thought that that would be achievable. And by December 21, that all category two patients would be seen within recommended guideline. And currently we had about 227 of those patients seen outside the guidelines. So, so that was our goal, well, mission statement. Um, so we went to, to, to the process, uh, brainstorming ideas. We then uh, streamlined it into the Pareto charts, see which ones are more common uh, themes, put them together into the fishbone diagram, and then uh, came down to six, to the six um, reasons. Um, one, and most important, was lack of communication with the patient, really, to and from the patient, and how to, how to really enhance that ability for patient to feedback to us if they can attend, for example. Um, there wasn't really a good, good process in place. Um, duplication and wastage of referrals. The GP send the referral, they don't get any feedback. Have we received the referral? Have the patient been put on the waiting list? So they send another one and then another one. So we had to then deal with the same duplicated, triplicated referrals, um, which again increases the work for, for, for staff and everybody else. And then scheduling, how the scheduling was done. They were overbooking the clinics because people weren't turning up. Then again, just double handling of, of all of that. Um, and then unclear, unclear governance. As, as Carly said, there are eight different specialties in the cancer center. Admin has to deal with all different specialties. And who owns what um, wasn't clear. And therefore, there was no, there was no um, governance over that part. Um, and that same goes with that number five. There was no clear definition of roles of the staff there who is responsible for what part of that portfolio. And, uh, and last one was a bit of difficulties in understanding how the doctors were interpreting the guidelines and, um, and, and therefore lack of transparency of, of what it means, which patients need to be uh, seen again in the clinic and reviewed, which can be uh, discharged back to the GP to follow up and so on. So there were about six main problems that we identified at that time. Interventions with each one of them were just put on the other side. Uh, first one was just establishing the standards of liaison with the services and communicating between. Referrals, standard uh, approach to referrals, how to process them. As Carly said, they were coming from three different sources, putting them together um, and trying to streamline that process. Um, same goes down there with the governance of the administration, uh, specific portfolios for admin staff, and then clinicians to to talk together and see how they would have a similar approach to the guidelines in terms of patient management. So intervention planning, we brought people back into the room. I think most of them were there. Um, I wasn't sure whether we can achieve that, but we managed to, to get most of, uh, of the uh, people who were involved with that uh, back in the room together and trying to discuss and agree on, on what would be common themes and how we to progress from there. 
So then we really looked at breaking down those six issues and how we're going to do interventions. So the first one was around that contact of the consumer. So uh, we trialled a little pilot intervention on the 7th of July where we're actually phoning patients in the week prior to their appointment to say, you know about your appointment, you're coming. Um, so it was a lovely small number to actually trial this on because it was only about 40 contacts a week. Um, and then if there wasn't a, an answer, we could leave a direct phone number. So normally it would go back through the central hub of outpatients and then this spiral starts. So this was a really direct phone number to the lady I was sitting next to who could then help to reschedule or cancel. So the ones you really want to see there are the orange ones. So they were the ones, or the red ones, so they were not aware or the wrong time. They wanted to cancel or they wanted to reschedule. And you had been qu quite high percentages there. So they were actually your failed to attends right there, even if someone just wasn't sick, um, you know, sick on the day. So we're really looking looking at um, the trend over the last sort of eight weeks of that trial to um, see that we haven't changed the attending too much, but we're really trying to narrow down um, that. And you can see there was one week that I didn't make phone calls. Uh, next one here is just around that referral. So it was um, sort of timely that we were moving into an EMR. Um, you know, part of the administration for outpatient had been on EMR and then now the clinical was. So it was a really great timing to really snapshot things. Um, and we were in a hybrid model. So there was um, referrals in sort of um, category um, a, you know, folders, but then also backlogs of folders that hadn't gone in there. And then when we run an EMR wait list, they didn't actually match up. So then we didn't know sort of where our true point of truth was there. Uh, so, you know, really first starts was just getting um, clear organisation and all of that, um, really looking at the layout of how referrals come in, how do we see a Cat 1 in the, all of that pile? So you can see the large pile that needed to be uploaded. How do I see a Cat 1 in there? So we really broke it down to then flagging systems to be able to show what ones we need to action first. Uh, we then ran audits once they were all on, on the Cat 1s and Cat 2 list. Um, I only did the first 100 of the Cat 2 list, but you're already seeing sort of 68 to um, percent of patients that had actually already been seen within the Flinders Cancer Clinic um, and just had stayed on a wait list, uh, ones who had failed to attend but hadn't then been rebooked, um, and, and also ones who'd gone elsewhere, country services, things like that. So it was a re um, we've been able to undertake that audit now to really sort of make sure that there's a point of truth in our demand booking now that we're in the EMR 100%. So then we looked at scheduling. Do you want to go on that one? Yeah. Yep. Um, so we were sort of looking at those averages that there was around eight patients per clinic seen. Um, and there was no, the main thing here was there was no quarantining of new or review. So they were all treated sort of just on spots. Um, so that was about 48 slots a week. We then had a new agreed EMR template from the doctors that they'd see six new patients per clinic and four review patients with just six for the um, registrars. So that was increasing only by about four slots per year. But what we noticed the big difference was is in the actual, you know, 89% increase in actual news by just quarantining how many of those are in a clinic um, to really start to see 17 more new patients every week purely by sort of quarantining news and reviews. So we really went to look at our TAC time, what was our capacity and demand picture. Um, so we sort of had 36 new spots per week, which was 1,800 a year. Uh, we factored in the annual leave, the PD days, six public holiday Mondays. We had a 15% buffer for failed to attends. And we were able to work out that sort of there was going to be expected, you know, last year, sorry, there was about 1,200 referrals. Um, and we can see 1,300 referrals, 1,350 referrals a year. So we can actually have the potential to see all of these new as we go along. So how do we regain the backlog? We're in a position now where we have 500, you know, waiting to come in that were overdue. Uh, we looked at last year, but then we also did a quick snapshot of this year just to see if anything had changed. And we predicted that we'd see one to two Cat 1s a week and about 15 to 20 Cat 2s that would come in as new referrals every week. So working on the 36 spots we had per week, we worked out that we'd need to allocate two of those to Cat 1s, 20 to Cat 2s, and 14 for a backlog sort of idea. There was 409 currently on the Cat 2s. And so we worked out that we then had a figure of how long with this new EMR templating we could actually regain our backlog and then be at the new, new mode of um, booking in and being seen within recommended timeframes. So this comes down to the utilization of the available space because that was another issue. There are eight different specialties, as I said before, and everyone competes for the space and then how to utilize the space correctly. So we have a, um, 
uh, three consultants working there. We have a senior edge as a fourth person now who can actually do the same, same work. And we are trying to add on additional clinic in the in afternoon on Thursdays, which was identified as a time when we could, we could access the room. And this is now uh, trying to be organized. So overall, we have six new patients in every clinic, four reviews. Um, we should then increase uh, to about 120 patients uh, new patients per year for this additional new clinic that we can do from our existing FT that we can just shuffle this around a bit. So that will increase that even further. Um, I just say on the last side, just for visual management purposes, the red meant that it was not used less than half 50% of the time. Um, green means it was 100% used over this sort of six week templating and the yellow is when it was down to sort of 75% utilisation. So it showed very clearly on a Thursday afternoons there was always at least one room free except the one week. Uh, a lot of administration process um, work has been underway with um, that service team, really looking at the layout, looking at better flow for the consumer, streamlined bookings, and then all around the standardisation of what the new referral management should look like. So now we come to uh, another interesting part, which is really how the clinicians do um, their work in the clinic. And I could see that there was a fair bit of difference between different clinicians on how they were working and how often they will see patients for the reviews versus ref referring them back to their GPs. So the guidelines are very clear that the certain types of, of changes that were identified on, at colposcopy could be followed up by the GP with another pap smear in 12 months time and therefore re-referring if required. Uh, so I've seen some differences there that, for example, out of four doctors, one doctor was uh, tended to keep the patients in the system much longer than they required. Um, so what we decided then to do in, into looking into what would have the highest impact and what would have the least effort to give us the most, most sort of uh, impactful change into this. So when we did make those changes, mainly in the administrative area, I had a discussion with each individual clinician as well about how they do their work and to look into how to help patients to, to not to have to come back to us unnecessarily. And they could be, uh, the GPs could be uh, a good source of, of reviews uh, to help us to manage patients, patients' load overall, but then has to be a decision made what type of patients could be reviewed by the GP safely and then return back to us if required. So trying to spread the load a little bit of the pressure that we have seen in our clinics. So by doing that, we have uh, reduced, and you can see it's very clearly on the, on the right-hand side, that we have a reviewed, um, re reduced the uh, by, ooh, uh, more than 50%, yeah. So we have reduced the uh, failure to attend rate from 30% down to 8%, just by those changes that we did in the administrative uh, area and changes on the scheduling and changes in the templates. Um, but changing the templates means that there were six templates for new patients and four only for reviews. So if doctors wanted to put more patients for reviews, they had to push that further and further back. And over time, they realized that they had to choose which patients to put for review back and which actually could go back to the GPs. So we put a bit of pressure on them by, by really structuring templates in a way they can't change. And therefore, that was one of the ways how we did this. So, um, yeah. Did you want seconds? That was just to double check that we weren't having increased cancellations just because I was ringing them. So we're just sort of watching that. There's been a little bit of a change in the last two weeks. So we're just watching that as a run chart as we go along. Um, and the next piece of work is really around how do we actually then fill those spots when we find out someone's not coming. So a week's not a lot of notice for um, women of the age where they're still working as well to be able to call in. So a lot of work still looking in there. Uh, a lot around standardising practice now um, of the things that we know are going to be working better. Uh, we were able to then put data forward for business cases and understanding what's happening down there. Um, so I'll just put all of these up there, but these are our to-do list really. Um, and the EMR templating takes about six weeks to formalise, so it's not just going to be a quick fix, but it's about um, you know, what future state will look like for us. Yeah, so just to, to add up to this, yes, it's a uh, ongoing work, but what we have shown here is that we can see all our patients that need to be seen uh, but just by purifying and, and improving the processes um, within the clinic, as well as adjusting the way how we see patients and how we utilize the GP as, a, as another source of, of um, support that we can re rely on safely. Um, so by December 21, we think that we'll see all category two patients within recommended guideline. 
um, and colposcopy clinic um, should maintain the failure to attend rate below 10%. We do do, and I think Kali just did another checkup on the clinic uh, not long ago to see whether we are still in that range. And I think it started to slowly creep up again. So it looks like that every few months there will have to be a bit more of a, of a kind of review and, and understanding that um, somebody is looking into that. So they are trying to maintain that at that, at that level. Um, there has been a little bit of a, of a pushback in a way that I had to adjust some of the clinics to allow a couple more reviews. So there were six and six rather than six and four. So there's always a little bit of a, of a give and take in, in these kind of situations. But what we, are, we have shown to, to be able to do is that, that when we look at it simultaneously at, at the whole workflow, that we could actually increase the number of patients seen in the clinic from about 700 to even 12 or 1,300. And we have it included all the time when the doctors are away for holidays, leave, and so on. So we haven't taken 52 weeks in a year, which was usually a complaint of most, most doctors saying, well, they never take into account when we are away for our PD or, or holidays. But we have done in this situation. And with all of that, there's still enough spaces to actually see those patients. Thank you. Sorry? I can't hear what you're saying. So. so, excellent project. Fantastic. So, you know, it's a combination of practice improvement, change management, and implementation science. So, you've sort of, you've sort of done it all. But what, and what you've done is, by standardising practice, you've created enormous capacity. And, what, and you've identified within your unit individual variation that was impacting significantly on quality of care. So, you know, a, a real exemplar. Uh, so there's a question here. At the start of this project, did you think you had enough capacity for demand? Uh, that's a good question. I actually thought we don't. Yeah, and I was really, I was really uh, pretty much pushing and preparing a, a, a business case to, to ask for more funding because I thought there's no way we can improve it. But, um, yeah. So I think you need to publish this. This, oh. this should be a project for publication. Because, and, and the lesson about we need more, we need more, without understanding what's creating your problem is, and it's just a wonderful exemplar. I think one thing on that is, yes, we've worked out that there's capacity with the doctors, but what we've really highlighted is there was a real um, pocket of administration that is under-resourced in that. So we've now actually got that data and we can see the impact that two hours a week can make and then that's able to be able to be valued. Mm. Yeah, in addition to that is that, that if we have a dedicated personnel who works in that particular space, they tend to own it more and I think we've shown that this is what is important and they will then work better in understanding the processes and then hopefully make them better. Now, I just wanted to add to this, the reason why I thought that this would be the ideal project to start these improvements because there are lots of areas in, in my department anyway where improvements could be made, but they seem to be very big, very large, and no one is prepared to tackle something that's very large to do. So I decided to, to take a one small area of my department, which is colposcopy, to see if things can be changed and then use the same type of process to move it into the other parts. And that, that's exactly the process. Break it down into component bits. That's how you break down complexity. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to be, have myself subjected to an improvement project on how to chair a meeting, but uh, so we better, we'd better move along. Thank you. All right. Susan, Susan Num, uh, advanced clinician, clinical psychologist with the Southern Youth Mental Health Service. Uh, to talk about group therapy programs for young people with emotion, dysregulation and self-harm. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Hi, everyone, and thanks for your continued interest this afternoon. I've got about 12 minutes to talk with you and then a couple of minutes to take questions, so please send your questions through or ask at the end. Um, very excited to be here today to tell you about some of our innovative group programs we have here at the Salen Health Service, particularly within our Youth Mental Health Service. We're based over at the GP Plus at Marion. I'm presenting today on behalf of our team, including researchers and clinicians who are listed on the slide here. 
And I've also got our contact number and our contact email address at the bottom. So if anyone would like to ask any further questions, talk further about collaborations, um, send us referrals. We are open to um, taking all of your interests. So please note these details down and I'll repeat them at the end of the presentation. Today I'm going to be talking to you about two of our group programs that we've started here in the youth service over the past 12 months and we've got another 12 months trial to continue these programs. It's a public, private and university collaboration which is quite exciting for us as part of Salen and something I think that we can do more of as part of our initiatives. I'm going to talk to you a bit today about what those programs involved, why we started them, and also about what are some of our initial data, some of our initial findings, some positive trends that I think the researchers in the audience will enjoy. Why it was particularly important, so with our Southern Youth Mental Health Service, we see young people aged 16 to 24 years of age who are at the more pointy end of clinical risk and complexity with serious emerging mental health concerns. These are young people who quite often have risk of harm to self or others, are challenged by clinical complexity in terms of their diagnosis, but also their psychosocial factors and families are heavily involved, usually a number of other agencies. We have young people moving in and out of hospitals, in and out of residential facilities. Um, some may be under the guardianship of the minister and some may be involved in some of our forensic and drug and alcohol sectors. So we're working with people who can't receive a service anywhere else. So fundamental for us to provide evidence-based care for people with a limited amount of clinicians that we have and we looked at doing more innovative group programs to service a wider group of people. The cost of the health system is enormous and all of us in the audience would have been touched by friends or family who have had mental health challenges and know what the impacts can be through our family and social networks. So through this, we looked at 50% of the young people we have coming referred to our service, primarily from emergency departments, inpatient wards, and from families and GPs, 50% of those people were presenting with emotion dysregulation, difficulties managing their emotions, difficulties understanding what their emotions are, and that can lead them to engage in impulsive risk-taking behaviours because they're uncertain of how getting their needs met and they've got some really strong emotional states they're trying to manage. It's out of their control. We looked at developing two programs to meet this great need that we had in our service. So for a number of young people, they are engaging in harm to self behaviours, self-harm, damage of the body tissue. This doesn't include tobacco use, drug use or eating disordered behaviours. We're talking about people who deliberately harm their body. And we looked at what's the research telling us with our cognitive behaviour treatment, so a, a bread and butter treatment, evidence-based tested empirical treatment in psychology, how can we use our CBT and what are we targeting in these young people? We're not going in targeting the behaviour, what's underlying the behaviour? And that was deficits in social problem solving. People who have difficulty interacting with other people about their problems. Classic for young people, but in this particular group, when that emotion dysregulation is so high, I can't communicate with others, I communicate it through releasing it through my body. So we work with the group 10 weeks, CBT focused, young people come to our, our service. Um, we talk about safety planning, we talk about distress tolerance strategies, we do cognitive challenging and give them the techniques to change these behaviours. We also offer drop-in sessions for the parents to come and see us so they can ask and find out more and more information about this program. We also offer a 25 week, so five or six month group therapy program where the young person and the parent comes to group together. They are both doing the work here. It's on five modules around learning how to manage strong emotions, deal with these interpersonal challenges, manage distress, and particularly for a DBT, dialectical behaviour informed treatment, a particular module for young people and families called walking the middle path. Finding when you're at polar opposites of disagreement in a family, whether it's about curfews or diet or boyfriends and girlfriends, how do we find the middle ground when both can have some truth in their orientation and their point of view? So what's the truth here? What's the middle ground here? And how can we negotiate? It's not always as simple as finding the grey within the black and white, but we teach skills on how to find that middle path. This is an innovative program in South Australia. It's been empirically tested internationally over the past 
five or six years in operation, uh, big in America, and here we brought it to South Australia, and it's the first of its kind here in Salem. The self-harm group was something myself and my colleagues developed here as part of the, the um, service as well. So both programs we're really excited about and we're heavily researching to see um, their efficacy. Just at the bottom there, I talked about DBT building a life that's worth living. And you'll hear that statement repeated throughout our programs. And I'll also come back to that statement at the end of the presentation today. Lots of considerations we had with these programs. Working with young people and families is not necessarily easy, and, and that's why some of them have found treatment and access to treatment so difficult in some of the private sectors that they've tried to source treatment. We also had to think about all the complexity and all the factors. We've got young people giving birth, 16-year-olds who are having their own children who have these extreme emotional experiences. We're up against drugs and alcohol. We're up against forensic presentations. So we're thinking about all these things with putting a large group of people together in a room. We're thinking about how can families attend because we've got families who are working. We've got families who are burnt out, families who have spent large amounts of their savings on trying to find treatment and they come to us and they say, I need help, but I'm giving up. And some of them have given up care of their young people into the state system, and we're working with those families to help repair those relationships. And we also had to think about how do we manage safety? How do we manage risk? How do we look after our staff? And how do we train our staff to work with these young people and these families so everybody's getting consistent, good care? better than treatment than usual, because we have to try and follow our NICE guidelines and try and deliver a treatment that's actually going to create an impact. One of the most exciting parts of this program was that we were able to achieve it through a public, private and university partnership. Without those partnerships, that wouldn't have been possible. So with these industry partnerships, and it's something really exciting to talk about here with the group today, it involved our government agency. It involved us working with a brokerage foundation who are passionate about finding research outcomes in mental health for young people. It involved us working with a not-for-profit private philanthropic group, the James and Dinah Ramsey Foundation, who many of you might know. Dinah Ramsey was a social worker, had an interest in working with young families and young people. We worked together with these agencies and we gave the pitch. We talked about budgets, we talked about proposals. What are we gonna deliver upon? How can we have collaborations? And it was around going into bat for young people and our families in our Southern region and saying, we can deliver on this and it's gonna make a difference. And those partnerships, those brokers, those foundations, they listened. And when they said, what would it cost to fund either or? What would it cost to fund both? They turned around and gave us the money for both. So a two-year trial where we've got support from the James and Dinah Ramsey Foundation and also a private gentleman in the community through the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation funding one position in our team to deliver this program alongside a lot of in-kind support from our team and also a research position. So over a quarter of a million dollars was put in outside of Saarland to fund these programs to ensure that we could deliver this service. Something that on behalf of Saarland I was so proud to announce that to our team. And I talk about these partnerships to our families that get involved in our programs. We've also sought support from the Special Purposes Fund in 2020 with receiving training for some of our clinicians and they're internationally trained um, through an American psych wire organisation to ensure that we have consistency um, and fidelity in our treatments. It's a two-year trial when we're evaluating the um, effectiveness of our treatments. We're working on doing more of these presentations, getting the word out further, going out and having outreach to services so they can refer to us and meet with us and send families to us because there's a lot of people out there in suffering. So we have to try and get people in and get them access to treatment. I'm enthusiastic. You can see that I'm a bit biased. I would love this to be accessible to people who live outside of our Saarland area. There are many people in country areas in other LHNs who are crying out for these sorts of treatments. And I go along to family and care conferences and I talk at these sorts of in-services and people say, can I just send my child, can I just send someone from over the catchment area? If you feel as strongly about this as well, we'd love to hear from you because we're going to need this advocacy if we're going to take this statewide. I've included link there to the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation website where you can read more about the partnership. Um, we've had some challenges throughout the time. I'm, they're up there on the slide and I'll quickly talk over these. We've 
had to work through COVID like everyone else. We've had to look at hybrid models of using telehealth because the groups have to keep going. We've had a lot of changes in staff. It's really attractive for a lot of services out there to get our trained staff and offer them more money and private offers more money. So we have clinicians who want to do this hard work and work with families and work with these challenges, but we've got to try and keep them and look after them. And part of our treatments look after our staff in terms of giving back that community of therapy to the therapists. We've got to keep our workforce going. One of the exciting parts for my role in terms of a clinical leadership role was to get the group programs embedded in, in a revised model of care, which is out at the moment for review. And that was a huge achievement because it was actually getting the evidence base into what we do. The data collection's ongoing. I'll share with you some slides about some stats in a moment. What we've done is extended out referrals from just receiving those within our team to those from anyone within any mental health or government service within Saarland, within any private or NGO service in South Australia. If your young person and family live in the Saarland catchment area and they present with quite a low threshold of clinical concerns, they can come along to these programs. Um, we've looked at um, doing some pre-commitment work with young people so when they come to the groups they're ready for it. They know what to expect because a lot of people come with a sense of ambivalence and they've tried a lot before getting here. They've heard a lot of statements throughout their treatment provision about challenges and challenges that they might face moving forward. We've also looked to involve our stakeholders in some key aspects of these young people and families care. The times when they graduate from these programs, the times when we celebrate their journey and they talk to that. We sit back and we let the families talk and we let the families stand up and say they wanna collaborate with some of our brokerage foundations and take their story further to encourage other people to come out and access care. Here's some stats. We've only been started in less than 12 months. So we're starting with our group programs here. It gives you a bit of an idea of the ages of people we're seeing and the gender spread. The retention rates have just dropped in recent times when our researcher helped me with doing these um, slides. Previously, they were higher than that, but these are fantastic retention rates when we look at the international evidence. Usually attrition's around 50% and we're doing better than that. I'm very proud of that. I'll walk through these bits quickly, just with another minute or so. In terms of our CBT for self-harm group, we're getting improvements in suicidal ideation. Not a target of our treatments, but something we measure because we're cross-referencing the data between the groups. So fantastic to see. We're also getting improvements in people regulating their emotions in the CBT for self-harm group. Not a target of the treatment, but a really pleasing, positive trend to see. People are actually getting better in other ways than what we were expecting. Let's have a look at the DVT group though, where we focus on building a life worth living, where part of the challenges of people that come to us are usually risk of harm to self behaviours, suicidal idea ideation, suicidal gestures and attempts. We are getting significant improvement. Oh, I have to be careful about that word. Positive trends at the moment in the data for improvements in suicidal ideation. Isn't this what we want for our young people? And the families are so proud. Difficulties in regulating emotions, both in the same tra trajectory. Things are looking bright. People are getting better at managing their emotions and understanding them and putting really key strategies and skills in place. That's the focus of the group, to upskill people in managing their emotions. But wow, the stats for people who are the support people, the families, the carers, the grandparents, the person that accompanies that young person into the DVT group and sits with, the, with them for 25 weeks, doing the coursework, doing the homework, sitting there and supporting other parents. We're actually seeing an improvement in how they see their young person express emotion. So part of our research team were matching um, questionnaires from the adults with the young people so we can get lots of data points there, lots of research, so lots of showcasing for sale and the good work that we're doing. For adults, it's going in the right direction. This is wonderful to see. Even better, a common measure, the work and social adjustment scale. Adults are able to spend more time at work. They're able to get better sleep. They're actually able to care better for their younger people in the family too. We're getting stats that are heading in the right directions. I mean, a spoiler alert, they all go in the right directions, but I didn't just cherry pick those. That's just actually what the research is. In terms of the burden for the carer, so we talk about how are you feeling? What's the impact been on you? How are you waking up each day? Well, they're waking up feeling more hopeful because their young person's not in EDs, they're not in hospitals, they're not talking about ending their life. 
they're, they're getting improve, improvements in the carers. So again, research trends in their own. And a common one that we might all know about, the depression, anxiety and stress scales, again, all heading in the right directions. And this is over a course of six months. So these aren't just sort of three measures over three weeks. Over six months, we're getting great trends. My last slide here, some quality of feedback that we get from one of those graduation ceremonies. So people who have completed six months worth of treatment. It's a long commitment for a 16 year old. They might not have even had a relationship that's lasted that long. And we've had people see through the course of the group. Lots of qualitative feedback there. I'll draw your attention to one right at the end. A young 16 year old who'd been in and out of home whose family had been unable to keep her in the family home. She'd gone into residential care on occasions and be surrounded by teen pregnancy, teen drug and alcohol abuse, um, homelessness, and people in and out of residential facilities. And she said, this is more than just research. It's people's lives. I might have been heading down the path of substance use, homelessness, or ending my life, and now I've created a life worth living and a strong relationship with her mother. So there's that philosophy, a life worth living. That's the philosophy of the treatment and now someone's actually living a life that's meaningful for them. There's our contact details again. Again, any follow-up inquiries, questions, referrals, um, interest, collaboration, research ideas, we'll welcome that. We've only got a year's left of this clinical trial and I've got to turn it around that Salen's gonna to wanna to take this on that this is going to be something that's beneficial not only for the families in our region but something that hopefully we can take statewide and something that we can all be proud of. Um, on behalf of Salem, thank you for your attendance and your interest today. Thank you very much. It's, uh, you're clearly very passionate about the, <laughs> about the work. Um, yes, in a minute. No, I don't have, there's nothing on here. I've got a blank slate. Um, obviously, I, I work in Aboriginal health, so my question is, so have you had Aboriginal people in this, in your groups? Surprisingly, we, we do get Aboriginal people referred to our service, but it isn't reflective of probably the common rates that you would expect within a mental health service. We have very good Aboriginal healthcare services in our region, Nunkamora and Yulti and other health services that um, support families and Aboriginal people. Um, we have had an Aboriginal consumer through our CBT group. Uh, but not our DBT group yet. Okay. Yes. Because, um, I mean, I, I work at Salon, you know, I, I work in the Salon Aboriginal Health Service, and this is my manager here, in fact, and we were completely unaware of this group because we'd be, a, and, and I have a particular, apart from the PhD, which is focusing on uh, older Aboriginal women, my other interest has always been young people, and I've, I've been looking for DBT for my young Aboriginal patients, so um, Nankwara Unity doesn't offer that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. I hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, you will. <laughs> you will. Yeah. All right, some spreading happening. Um, very quick question, not maybe uh, hard to answer, but what happens to the ones you don't retain? Well, they've been few and far between, which is really a good sign. As part of our good clinical care for any of our young people and families, um, it's always around connecting people back to secondary care. And many people that leave our programs will go on and have private practitioners or other NGO support okay. in the community. So, so lost. yeah, with the types of presentations that we see, people don't just not have anything and it's around us connecting people back to those and just letting people take that ownership and ring up to the lived experience services to the health services that the e-health resources web chat it's connecting people back to their community all right thank you very much thank you thank you so Vanessa's been very patiently waiting in the waiting in the stores so, <laughs> Vanessa Ellison is the current director of women's and children's division I think that's the right terminology. Um, and she did a wonderful CIP project a year or so ago on Neo Snug or keeping small babies warm. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Rob. I just get myself organised. So in 2019, we started some improvement work in the neonatal unit. Um, aiming to improve admission temperatures in preterm infants less than 32 weeks gestational age. Um, and we had the great support of coaches Bev Thomas and Ali Bevan Davis. And I'd also like to thank Rob Padbury and Professor Sue O'Neill who are always very encouraging of this program, uh, project from the outset. We knew this was a problem worth solving um, because around uh, international um, 
units, there's more discussion about the early stabilisation of these infants, which really means the first few hours after their uh, delivery. Um, this stabilisation requires more than one person, so it's teamwork um, and attention to detail, and these were areas we knew needed some improvement. Uh, we were able to identify admission temperatures as a priority for improving the stabilisation. We had some data to support the fact there was a problem. Over a five year period, um, we knew that for babies under 32 weeks, 54% of them were hypothermic on admission. Um, if we looked at the extremely more vulnerable babies under 28 weeks, it was 57%. Uh, not only were they hypothermic, but there was a huge variation in the low temperatures, with many of them in the moderate category as defined by the World Health Organization. Just to give you some context for this um, uh, cohort, um, we are part of the Australian New Zealand Neonatal Network um, where uh, all the intensive cares do share uh, data about survival and long-term outcome. And we are grateful with this, for this transparency um, as we are a medium-sized unit. Um, and there's a picture of a couple of our recent graduates. We also, like many areas, have increasing activity, um, but the growth area is not in the babies under 32 weeks, so those numbers are fairly stable over a number of years. The growth um, area for admissions is the babies um, 32 weeks to term. But the complexity of babies under 32 weeks has changed, with more babies in the 23, 24, 25 week age group um, with more complex uh, health needs. Um, where do we sit in terms of survival? This shows how we compare to the, uh, the network. Um, to be admitted to the network data set, you are um, under 32 weeks of age and survive more than four hours. Um, so th this is this cohort that we're talking about. But what you'll appreciate is that by 26 weeks, if you are admitted to a neonatal unit, your survival is over 90% as well in the 90s. And even at 24 weeks, um, it's 70% uh, around 70%, which is actually very high. So the issue with hypothermia is around the adverse neonatal outcomes. There's international uh, data. This was a large uh, cohort from the Canadian Neonatal Network, looked at 10,000 babies, and they showed the relationship between temperature and adverse outcome. Um, and it showed that the lowest rates of these morbidities was associated with emission temperatures 36.5 to 37.5. There is a human face to these morbidities. This is a picture of young Oliver, who is a lovely 25 weeker, 525 grams. Um, and the picture on your far left shows him going home with his chronic lung disease on his, on his home oxygen. The picture next to that is when he was about three weeks of age, he's intubated, he's got a stoma underneath his nappy. The picture on your, on your right is Oliver um, on his first birthday, which is in May of this year. Um, and at this age, we know he's got a hemiplegia. You might not see that in the picture, but we know that he has a hemiplegia. And each one of those colourful beads he's holding uh, represents a pr procedure or intervention or investigation he's had. So blood transfusion, chest X-ray, ultrasound, surgery. We scoped out our problem. Um, we assembled a uh, identified stakeholders, we assembled a team, and we defined the starting point of our problem. Starting point was when the neonatal team had communication that a preterm baby was going to be born, and our end point was the admission temperatures. We set ourselves a mission statement, so by six months we were aiming to improve the rates of hypothermia, so that uh, the hypothermia rate was less than or equal to 20% of babies that were admitted. We mapped out the process, um, so everything that happened around that first communication through to what happens at delivery. Delivery can occur in a variety of settings at Flinders, through to everything that happened until that baby was admitted. There were quite a few constants about what happens, but there were huge variables, particularly around delivery. Uh, many of those related to the, the circumstance of the birthing mother and, and the baby, but many variables around uh, also clinician approach. We had to do some myth busting uh, and what we um, found to be factually correct is that theatre temperatures could be increased to 32 degrees. Uh, it only took 15 minutes to do that. Um, and we also found out that the birthing suite has a set temperature of 22 degrees in each room. 
Um, it's supplied by one air conditioning uh, service and has very limited capacity to change individual room temperatures. We um, were dealing with some uh, current equipment in our repertoire. Um, there was a plastic wrap. Now there was evidence from the literature that using a plastic wrap did increase admission temperatures, or, but we were not seeing that in our population. Um, we have, this is the resuscitator that we take to deliveries. Um, and when babies are come actually into the nursery, the incubator temperature can be 35 degrees, uh, the room temperature is 26 degrees, and the humidity is 70 degrees, so quite different from the rest of the hospital. We constructed a Pareto chart through multi-voting to help us work out our interventions um, and work further with our problem solving. There was one standout um, uh, issue there, and that was not using the plastic wrap correctly. But you can see that there were many others that had a similar uh, level of scoring there. So from that, we were able to develop our top 10 uh, uh, interventions. Um, we developed those around the top 10 causes. As I said, the standout one was not applying the plastic wrap properly, but many of the others had a similar level of uh, voting. So what we did is we picked out the four that are highlighted there. Uh, the neo wrap issue, um, the cold environment babies were being born into, communication breakdown between neonatal unit, theatre, birthing suite, um, and no longer having a warm hat available as a routine. Um, oops, sorry. Um, one of our interventions was developing a communication checklist. We have a dedicated phone line for emergency deliveries. This communication checklist sta stays by that phone. Um, and uh, when we hear that there's a baby under 32 weeks going to be delivered, one person, the team leader, contacts the theatre coordinator and asks for the theatre temperature to be increased. This has to be done 15 minutes prior to the scheduled delivery. Um, and we, we were able to um, audit, well, we were able to measure compliance with this process in our CIP project. Now, this you might think, oh, this just applies to theatre. The reason we were focusing on this uh, largely is because most of these babies are actually born in theatre, well over 50%, um, and sometimes it can be up to 80% actually deliver in theatre. We had a bit of fun. Uh, we had a competition to come up with a uh, catchy name, and so we developed the name Neo Snug, and we developed some stickers that people could wear on their scrubs. Um, this was a pretty sort of low intervention piece of fun and resulted in a huge amount of interest in the unit in people who weren't really that interested in the, pro in the project. Um, and we then started a bit of a run chart. Um, we changed the way we reported on this as time went on, but we just started, each baby that came in, uh, we would record the temperature on a chart, put, place that up around multiple places in the nursery to, to really make it visible to everyone. Um, we also constructed a bit of an action plan as to how, what jobs we needed to do to work on these interventions. In terms of pr improving our intervention around the plastic wrap, we identified some champions. Now these were, nurse, these were nurses and these people were easily identifiable at our, at our mapping and planning days. They were passionate about the project and keen to be involved. And what they did is they um, would accompany people to theatre or, or delivery that hadn't been for a while. They would talk through them what they needed to do to use the plastic wrap. Um, the other thing they would do is if there was time before going to delivery is that they would run through the resuscitation plan and how to use the plastic wrap. They wore these um, you know, labels each day, so they made them very visible um, to, to be there and to be able to help. So our first day of implementation of all of this uh, was on the 9th of June 2019. Um, and this is what happened in the three and, uh, pre and post intervention three months. So we went from a rate of hypothermia of 54% down to a rate of 40%. Um, now this was, this was, this was encouraging, um, but we really thought we were working very hard to get this number down and were a little bit disappointed that it wasn't um, more uh, noticeable. But when we actually looked at the babies in more detail, um, it did show a clear uh, issue um, about where you were born. And what it showed to us that if you were born in the birthing suite, you were most likely to be cold. No one was ever uh, hyperthermic if they were born in the birthing suite, you were most likely to be cold. 
you might have a normal temperature, but you're most likely to be cold. Whereas if you were born in theatre, you were most likely to have a normal temperature. It might be slightly elevated, um, but it was very unlikely you'd be cold. We didn't really want to have two different systems for two different locations, so we had to think a bit differently. And what we did is we found this uh, NeoHelp plastic wrap, um, and it is a, it's like a poncho uh, with Velcro and an absorbent pad in the, in the bottom. Um, and what it is, is it's sterile, so we can scrub up, and in theatre we can scrub up and deliver the baby uh, directly into that. The advantage of this is once it's on, it's much less likely to take it off. The problem still with the plastic wrap is once it goes on, it's on and off and creates a cold breeze around the baby. So we decided to see if we could use this to improve the environmental temperature of all babies. Um, and what we found is that after the second PDSA cycle using this, that there was a further improvement in our admission temperatures. And so the rates of hypothermia went down um, uh, further to 30%. 30, 30%. Um, and also within this, there was less variability, a uh, less variability. Um, where, where are we now? We're well, tracking a few months later, 16 months post-commencement. Post um, we were not seeing any babies cold, we were seeing a few that were warm, but those temperatures of hypothermia were coming down very quickly. But we've seen a big reduction in the rates of hypothermia. My point from that is it took us more than the six months to reach our target, but you know, by about nine months we really had some much, much better results. I think people just needed a bit of practice. Um, this is nearly two years post-commencement, um, and we've still seen some good, good rates in terms of reducing hypothermia. Now, I was asked to provide some up-to-date uh, data. Um, so we are now two years, three months post the start of this project. Um, and what we're wanting is these data points to be on or between the blue lines. And we can see there's been an improvement in admission temperatures. There's much less variability. Um, the rates of hypothermia have come down. I would prefer not to have that last uh, dot point there, but that's part of the variation we see. This is a very uncommon variation, but it does happen every few years. This, unfortunately, is a baby, 24-weeker. It was born on the antenatal ward, um, and its admission temperature was 33 degrees. In fact, this baby has a very severe underlying arthrogryposis um, clinical problem, but she still does meet the criteria for coming under the ANZNN um, uh, cohort. So she is very much included in our numbers, um, and although she's in intensive care, she's beginning a palliative care uh, pathway. Um, we, our experience with CIP was very positive. We got to meet some other great Salen staff, which was excellent. Um, there was national interest in our approach because it was a common problem that many people were having problems solving. Um, we found staff in our unit who wanted to engage more and those people have continued on to do other things in the nursery. And there was an increase in, increase in joy at work, I do believe, for some people in the nursery. Our work was very vis visible to families. Uh, they would ask us what we, we were doing, what it meant, and you know they, they were impressed that as part of our daily work, we, was, we were trying to do things better. The visual cues were essential um, to keep this at the forefront of our mind. We tried to celebrate success with stakeholders, particularly theatre staff, and would feed back to the theatre coordinators regularly. Um, and that was really p positive for the ongoing momentum. And we tried to have a bit of fun with it. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. There are so many lessons in there. Um, Fantastic results, and you've sustained it. <laughs> Up the last one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's life. You know, life's sometimes messy, and that's uh, that's an example. Yeah. So the sustainment is really important. It, just a couple of keywords on how you sustained. Review, review, review. Okay. Um, track track the data. Feed it back. You know, yeah. every few babies, I try and keep an eye on what's happening. Feed it back. There's many other things people are thinking about on a daily basis. Feed it back to the team and keep going. And you had some fairly great uh, implementation science things in there with some b b the b with the uh, labels and so on. It was yeah. excellent. I can see that a little, an opportunity for us to actually modify some stuff in the CIP program to do a bit more about implementation science. <laughs> so yes, it's an, an opportunity I've just mm. thought about sitting here this afternoon. So are there any, sorry, I haven't looked here. Are there any, uh, too many things to manage beyond the complexity of my feeble mind. 
Um, nothing there. So, any questions quickly from the audience? So, I'll give you an opportunity, seeing as we're now into happy hour. All right. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. And is that have you published that? No, I need to. You need to. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely. No, that's a that's a. a uh, one that definitely needs to be published. Now, I just want to read something out here. Um, I've, I've had a number of text messages from Jenny Richter during the afternoon, and she's been uh, tuned in, uh, unfortunately, from a distance. So, and I read, would you be able to pass on, my, pass on my thanks on behalf of the board for all the excellent work that is occurring through the CIP program? The board should indeed be very proud of our staff, the care that they demonstrate to our patients and to each other, and the service improvements that are being achieved. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be at FMC this afternoon. Thanks, Jenny. So, worth knowing. All right, I will disappear and uh, let whatever now needs to happen, happen. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for being such a great chair for the last uh, little while, and it's been a, you know, just another excellent session. So um, congratulations to everybody who's presented. I think we've really enjoyed it so much. Um, I'm going to be, ooh, where are we? Let's have a, just, here we go. I'm just going to quickly um, wrap up if I can. There's just a couple of things. So thank you for sticking around. I hope it won't be uh, too long. There's a, a bit there. I, um, the team who've been doing this have really enjoyed it. We've had a great time, and, uh, but we can only do it because we've had a great audience as well and great presenters. Um, so thank you. We've, we've got a lot of lessons to learn for next year, and um, I, I will come to that as, as we go along. The, um, you've seen there's been a lot of videos. I'll turn around when it comes to me, but this is what's happened in the last two weeks. Research, communicate with the greater audience in this organisation and externally with our partners, Flinders University, Proven the Foundation, our community, our patients, and also to celebrate all the great work that's being done here and showcase that to everybody. My name's Andrew Burston and I'm the Director of Research at Sarlin and I've got the pleasure of starting off our event today. I hope you'll enjoy the week as much as we've been planning it. I really look forward to seeing this series of talks from um, Sarlin based researchers. We've organised the way we think about research at Sarlin into four fields, so discovery science, clinical trials, health services research and continuous improvement or implementation science. Sarlin is committed to improving the delivery of health and medical research outcomes in the South. We thought pretty long and hard about the strategy here and felt that we wanted to further develop a culture of inquiry and get that inquiry across everybody to really put it broadly across the whole community at Sarlin. We've got over 8,000 employees here and if we could enhance their questioning, their sense of inquiry, their curiosity, that that would really be the game changer for research and take us to another level. We found a fundamental biological change which has a large impact on the affected individuals. You can use deep, deep learning approaches to try to tease out associations that you wouldn't have thought existed. Our group tries to work more around the level of involve and collaborate. Who would have thought five years ago that people could walk through our labs, our wards and our clinics using augmented reality? It is the sort of research that inspires the next generation of researchers. that we have the opportunity to see that firsthand. You can see here the majority of patients in this phase one study had tumour to trunk, and that's quite exceptional. I think that could possibly be a, a way forward. So thank you. thanks for tolerating us there. Um, 15, 15 sessions over five, uh, five days, I've seen five presenters. You've seen um, 
I think the posters were fantastic. T today, um, probably the best day of the posters, but e every day's been really wonderful. Um, 371 Networking on Hoover, I think we're a bit behind. I think it might be a bit more than that, but anyway, a lot. Um, you see the numbers watching live and recorded there, out of date. I think now um, it's about 4,000. So that's, that's, I think that's truly remarkable. So we have touched a lot of the organisation. A lot of people are watching, uh, watching this. And uh, thank you for those who are, are watching it. Sometimes that's just the best way to go. But we really appreciate the, the live audience as well. It's fantastic for the presenters and for it's actually very important. Now, I do have um, an award here. Oh, Dominic Howe. Dominic Howe has come through for the Broken Thumb Award. You'll probably, um, for those of you who can see that X-ray there, I think I correctly identify those rather nasty Bennett's fracture. But, but uh, is Dominic here? If you want to come down for this, this is the the Broken Thumb Award. <laughs> it's in, in not quite in house. He wasn't part of the organising committee, but this is for the most number of points on Hoover. <laughs> 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 Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> that makes me pretty happy. Um, look, as you know, Flinders Foundation have been extraordinarily generous. Um, there are some um, prizes for the best free papers and posters that are voted on and by an external group. And we will announce that um, next week. The voting uh, closes on, at 3pm on Monday, so please make sure you vote for the best stuff. But I think there's, there's already the discovery science. I think I saw 73 votes in already. That's pretty good, actually. That's, pr that's pretty good active stuff. The Hoover's been an excellent um, addition to us this week. Uh, we're extraordinarily pleased to announce um, Silent Research Grant Round. Um, Flinders uh, Foundation, the volunteers have partnered with Silent. Um, the pool for the coming year is three hundred thousand dollars. We've got an aim to make that to a million dollars <coughs> within a few years. And I know that sounds pretty ambitious, but we've been ambitious this week. And I think Flinders Foundation is ambitious, and um, and so are others with us. So um, I, I'm pretty proud of that. Actually, I think that's a really great move. Um, there'll be a flyer come out, and we will formalise that with processes. But that will take some weeks, probably. Uh, last week of October, before we get to that, we've got to organise our finances, we've got to have the right processes about it, but we're, we're pretty excited about it. It's going to support the research strategy, uh, improve the capacity uh, that we have in the organisation, and I hope provide seed funding for lots of uh, things that we're doing here. Now, I'm going to invite Peter, can you come down as well? I'm also um, really proud that we've got um, some other, other additions to this. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I spoke at the beginning of the week about the role of com com uh, consumers in joining together with the partnership of uh, moving through with research, etc. <coughs> research is the benefit uh, 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 provides a benefit for consumers as we move forward, and we're keen to continue that process in terms of understanding more about using research to build uh, a positive view through Silent about the value of consumer voice, either that through the patient voice, either what they're saying and telling us and giving us our feedback, and to have that done with some ev ev more evidence base, or the ways that we can actually improve um, our um, consumer voice. This today, 12 months ago, we mourned the passing of Melita Kimber, who had been passionate about um, inquiry, passionate about consumers, and passionate about improving. So I'm really grateful to the Flinders Foundation, to people who are going to work together now to have an annual research grant based on Let's look at ways that we can listen, act, make better together. And to be that as a dedication to Melita. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think it's a great initiative and thank you for the Flinders Foundation uh, here. I think that's 
wonderful. That will then the call for that will come out with the uh, with the Salem research round. You'd be pleased to know this is I think this is the end of me just about um, on the on the app. Um, there's an opportunity for you to help us. We we will reflect on this. We think I've said that I think we got more things right than wrong this week, but uh, you know we want to improve in the true. Uh, you know, passage of today, we continuously want to improve with, we can do some, some things better, we'd like to hear from you. One way is to, uh, to type it in, tell us where we should be in 12 months time, we'll take that on board. We've, we're going to our research council with quite a lot of things that we've got from this week as well. Any, uh, any other feedback you'd like to give us in any other form, we're happy to have it and we'll try to, uh, we'll try to take it on board and see what we can do in 12 months time when we do this again. So I think, um, I guess maybe we should have Salem Research Week 2022 there. But anyway, that's, our, that's the end for us today. So thanks for hanging around today at the end of a very long week and a long day. But I think it's been, um, I think it's been worth it and I'm proud to be here. So thanks so much.